from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. All right, today is June the 27th, 2016. This is David Klein from the History Department at Virginia Tech and working for the Civil Rights History Project of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian International Museum of African American History and Culture. And uh, behind the camera today, we have John Bishop from Media Generation. We're also joined by Guha Shankar of the Library of Congress. And we have the great honor to be here in Alhambra today in California uh, with Carlos Montez. And if I could ask you, this is the only time I'll coach you at all, is to introduce yourself with a full sentence, I am or my name is, and when you were born and where. Yeah, and, and I prefer to say LA, you know, LA. Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my name is Carlos Montes. Uh, I was born in El Paso, Texas, uh, on December 28, 1947. And I live in uh, Los Angeles, California. Fantastic. And can you, let's just start with your childhood. Can you tell us a little bit about your people, you know, where, where they were from, and, um, sure. and, then, and, and their journey, and then your journey here? No, absolutely. My parents are from uh, the northern part of Mexico, Chihuahua, small little farming village. It's not even on the map, but it's near uh, Parral, Chihuahua, mining town. Uh, they were from uh, Las Cuevas. Now, they moved up to the northern part of the border to Juarez, where they, where they uh, worked and, and lived. Now, I was born in El Paso, Texas, across the border. So my parent, you know, did cross over to, to the hospital, the uh, Hotel Du. So the first uh, five years of my life, I was raised in Juarez. So I spoke Spanish. I went to public school. Uh, my dad was a cab driver. My mother was a uh, nursing assistant and a housewife. So it was a good life, you know, on the border, living on the border. Uh, it was good times in, in Juarez, Chihuahua at that time. And siblings? Did you have siblings? Uh, yes, yes. I have an older uh, sister, uh, Marilu, Lulu, also born in El Paso, Texas. And then my younger brother, Javier, also born in uh, El Paso, Texas. Okay. And you lived there as a young child? Yes. And then yes. moved? And then we moved uh, briefly to El Paso, just for a couple of weeks. Uh, my parents, uh, my, my mother already had residence status in the United States, so we were waiting for my dad to get his residency status. Uh, back then they called it the green card. And it was my mother's idea to move, to move to L.A., to Los Angeles. And it was a major move. I remember the day we were in the uh, El Paso train station, small little train station. Uh, uh, we were outside waiting for the train. We got on the train and uh, it was a long ride, but I remember the, uh, the African-American uh, workers, uh, I think they call them the Pullman or the yeah. Porters. That's right, Pullman Porters. Yeah. Right, you know, I, I, they came by at, at night and turned off all the lights where my mother was reading a little Mexican novel. But every so often I would tell my, ask my mom, are we there yet? In Spanish, ya llegamos, ya llegamos. She said, no, no, no. And finally, uh, you know, when we got to L.A., she woke us up. We're here, we're here. And I was like in semi, uh, not shocked, but, you know, I was like, whoa, whoa, where are we here? And um, I remember the, uh, getting to the train station, the uh, uh, Union Station at, in L.A. It's a, a big uh, Art Deco uh, Spanish combination design. It was humongous compared to the El Paso one. So when, I, when we got to the station, we walked through it to the main lobby, uh, I knew we were in for a, for a ride. I said, oh my God, this is the big station, you know. So I, 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 something told me that something, you know, LA was going to be a major, major experience. Mm -hmm. And where did you all settle? We settled in South LA. My dad had come previously, got an apartment. He got a job in a furniture uh, assembly line factory. Uh, and uh, so we moved into South LA, they call it Florencia area, Florence area. And I went to school there, we went to school there, elementary school, and uh, started to learn English, you know, what they call survival English. And did your, did your parents eventually learn English as well, or did they mostly speak Spanish? You know, my, my dad was fluent in English and Spanish, because uh, he had come to the United States before to work when he was uh, younger. My mother is primarily Spanish, so she became a full-time housewife where my dad worked at the, uh, at the factory. It was, uh, I think it was called uh, Mission Furniture. Mm -hmm. 
They produced uh, coffee tables. He was on the assembly line. He was also in the carpenters' union, industrial section. Right. So can you, and about what year was that? That you? Arrived? You know what? That was 1956. 1956. Okay. In the in the late 50s. So what's the racial map of Los Angeles, of Los Angeles in the mid-50s? Right. Well, you know what? That area of South L.A. was uh, older whites. There was a few white families there, not very many. Blacks had, were moving in from the south, from Louisiana, Mississippi. We were coming from Mexico. So it was interesting. It was Chicano and black. And we got along pretty well. You know, even though my mother didn't speak uh, English, you know, there was something about, come, I guess, coming from uh, another state and from a rural background that we got along. One of my neighbors, a young African-American uh, teenager, raised pigeons, flying pigeons or tumbling pigeons, and I was fascinated by that. And also that my neighbors were one of the first, uh, when I met the first cholos or pachucos mm -hmm. or gang members, if you want to stereotype it, you know, they were from Florencia. And they treated me really well, but I saw them. They had their low rider. They had their, you know, their 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 look, uh, their uh, the the, uh, the the beard, the, the the hairdress, the tattoos, and you know, I played ball with them, and uh, you know, they treated me nice and they respected me. So I've always respected uh, the so-called uh, pachucos uh, uh, or cholos. And uh, yeah, so we went to school. I remember the first days of school was kind of uh, interesting. I didn't know a word of English, so I had to kind of learn. My first day in the cafeteria, I didn't know where to go, you know, get your food and get your utensils, you know. But there was always you a young, remember that? young, I remember that. No, I remember that. I remember those because there was a young Chicano that the teacher told him, you know, help him out, you know, tell him where to go, what to do. How did you, do you remember knowing how you thought about yourself, how you defined yourself then, because as you said, a young Chicano, were you thinking in those terms yet? No, no, not yeah. yet, not yeah. yet. No, no, I wasn't thinking, you know, but, but, but I mean, the young guys, I saw them that they were obviously uh, Mexican mm -hmm. or Mexican-American. I say Chicano because they, they look like they were fluent in English right. and they knew some Spanish. So, so I identified with them because, you know, they, they, they were visibly, you know, they were, they were uh, brown, they had black hair, and, and, you know, their names were Jose or Martin. So at least I felt comfortable in, in, in the school, in the classroom. The teacher was Anglo, white, uh, blonde, you know, and uh, trying to get me to say the, the name of the ball, you know. You know. I just wanted to play with the ball, but they were trying to learn, you know, teach me English, you know. English, uh, basic English, mm -hmm. but there weren't any Eng any uh, English uh, classes or any uh, English as a second language classes. Nothing so I, I learned survival English, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so as you went through school, uh, how about the what you were learning? Where did you see yourself reflected in any of what you were being taught? How were they uh, talking about, you know? Latinos in the school system. At that yes, time. yes. No, I, I didn't see any of our history there. I didn't mm -hmm. see uh, myself in the history, you know, and, and especially in middle school and high school. I, I saw, you know, the uh, U.S. history, the, the, the Alamo version, you know, the, uh, the basic, you know, uh, the founding father, George Washington, etc. So uh, there wasn't anything that I could identify with. I, I'll, I do remember one time they showed the movie, The Alamo. And uh, I, I, the feeling among the, 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 the crowd or the students was kind of uneasy, you know. We, we, you know, we couldn't really uh, articulate what we were going, what we were going, but we knew that something was wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Because mm -hmm. they were glorifying the Jim Bowie and Davy Crockett and the Alamo and remember the Alamo. And we were saying, wait a minute, you know. You know we were on the other side here. We're, we're really, why are you glorifying the other side? But, you know, we were young and we didn't know what was going on. But um, there were experiences like that, that, uh, that later on in high school, the, the racism was a little bit more blatant. I actually, before I that, before I'll back up a little bit, we were still living in South L.A. I went to Miramonte Elementary School. And we used to like to go to the show uh, in, uh, in an adjacent city named uh, Huntington Park. Now that whole area of Southeast LA was still primarily white, white working class, uh, Huntington Park, uh, Bell, uh, 
Cartagena uh, because they had the auto industry, the steel industry. But I remember we wanted to go to the show in Huntington Park. So we walked over there and we, we took the, the, um, the residential route because of the, the, we wanted to walk on the, on the lawn because it was hot. And as we saw a sign in, in the apartment building that uh, said, for rent, whites only. Now you're talking in the late 50s, 56, 57. It was my sister and myself, and we looked at the sign, and they go, whites only, I mean, and we, to say, we, I mean, we said to ourselves, they don't want any blacks. And then we go, what about us? You know, we're not white, we're not black. I wonder what, what they think about us. So we didn't answer the call, we just kept thinking about it, you know. So and, that's one uh, of the first times that that yeah. those kind of thoughts went through your mind, yeah. Yes. Trying to make sense of something yes. that's very complicated. Right, that's yeah. true, that's true. Yeah. And then being in Huntington Park, it was mostly white, you know, primarily white, you know. Can now you, today it's 99.9 .9 Mexican, Mexican record. Mm -hmm. So looking back, are there other particular moments where you can start to see your sort of consciousness forming? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In, in high school, uh, I started to see uh, remarks by teachers, you know, condescending remarks, sometimes racist remarks that would pick up on. I remember one specific uh, day, it was, uh, I think it was St. Patrick's Day. So we had a teacher talking about St. Patrick's Day and we're in green. And then, you know, I was trying to, you know, uh, uh, articulate, you know, something a little different. That, you know, we're not Irish, Irish American. We're 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 Mexican. I, and I told them, but well, we're uh, our descendants are the Aztecs. And I didn't know what I was talking. I just kind of threw it out there. I had never studied uh, history. And he made a statement. He looked at everybody. Oh, Carlos says we are all a bunch of ass. You know, he put an emphasis on the ass, you know, that he's an Aztec. And, he, and then everybody looked at me and we're all kind of embarrassed. And what are you going to do? Are you going to say anything? And I didn't say anything, but I kind of really got mad. And I never forgot, <clears throat> forgot that, that instance. That, um, one of the other teachers that was there, <clears throat> a, young, a younger um, Anglo-American teacher, um, was, he, he got visibly embarrassed. I could tell his face kind of got, you know. Uh, blush, blushing, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the, the history <clears throat> that we were being taught, you know, it didn't show anything about uh, our, our experience. Were there um, <clears throat> places that you could go to get, so to start to get some more history about yourself and your people? No, no, not that I recall in, in the, in, now I'm talking high school. Mm -hmm. In, uh, <clears throat> in middle school, I was, uh, it was a black Chicano uh, students in South LA. But right before I, I, um, I completed middle school, we, we moved to East LA or Ball Heights, mm -hmm. which was primarily uh, Mexican American, Japanese American, and some black. <clears throat> For high school. Mm -hmm. Right, so my high school experience I started experiencing uh, police abuse, police harassment. Because what we would do in East LA, we would go cruising, uh, cruising Whitter Boulevard. That was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I would see the sheriff stop people, and then later on, we got stopped. You know, and my friend was driving, and I remember one particular night, they stopped us, and uh, they went through the whole car, the back seat, the trunk of the car. And we kept telling him, what are you looking for? You know, he kept smirking at us. And, and I said, and we, you know, my friend finally told him, why did you stop us? He said, you stopped us because the, uh, the, uh, the little light above the license plate was off. And I said, is that the only reason, you know? And we ended up, you know, uh, 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 no ticket, no arrest. But it was just, we saw it as just harassment. Mm -hmm. Later on, uh, it happened again to me and my best friend, Richard. And my best friend Richard told the police officer, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> and I remember that. <clears throat> Excuse me. The police officer, and he happened to be a Chicano guy, tell him, see this billy club? I could stick this billy club up your ass and bring it out of your mouth. And I had told my friend, don't say anything, you know. Don't, you know, these guys are crazy, you know. And he looked at them, and he looked at me, and, he, and, and then later on I told him, I told you, that's how they are, you know, they don't say anything, man. These guys are like, are aggressive and brutal. And, um, so you never, learned that early? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
Yes, cruising the boulevard and watching people getting harassed and, and be, getting arrested and us being harassed and stopped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So uh, keep asking me questions because I, yeah, I, I kept talking. No, I didn't no, know. I didn't no, know we're what, perfect. It's, we're going great. Well, I got to get the feeling of where you wanted to go yeah, to. I no, don't know. So I'm just walking, walking you through high school and getting a sense of where um, this as you started to sort of form a consciousness, uh, yeah. a race consciousness. So okay. I'm I, curious I, about, about that. And did, okay. did that happen in high school or after high school? Yeah, and the, okay. No, that, that was in high school that we were cruising the boulevard and, and looking at the scene at the police harassment, the racist comment by the teachers. The uh, experience going through high school, I felt like we were just going through the, uh, the motions. I could tell there was a group of students they had books, they had glasses, always had pins that were being taken care of. But the rest of us were just kind of going through the motions of high school. I remember they put a big emphasis on ROTC, of uh, joining the, the military training. They put a big emphasis on auto mechanics, industrial arts, and uh, not a lot of emphasis on, on uh, college uh, preparation. And I remember uh, in my senior year, I went to talk to my counselor and I told her I wanted to go to college. Or I was interested in going to college. She just kind of smiled at me like, uh, and, and didn't say yes, you know, this is what you got to do. She told me, what, what would you be interested in a book binding course? Right, and I, got, I didn't know what she was talking about. And I told her, I just kind of went off. I said, I'd rather write the book than bind the book, you know? And she kind of like laughed at me and didn't do anything. and. Um, Ended up going to work after high school in the same factory with my dad. Mm. And it was hot, and it was a lot of sawdust, and it was for the summer. Me and my best friend Richard went to work, work there. And then, you know, we were saying, you know what? This is too hard. Let's go to college. We ended up going to East L.A. Community College. Okay. Yeah. So you enrolled there, and what were you studying? I, I wanted to study political science and I also got involved in student government. I uh, ran as a student body parliamentarian, got elected. So I was trying not, you know, I was trying different things, you know. In, in uh, high school, I tried cross country, I tried uh, different clubs. Uh, one thing I really loved about high school that kept me in school was uh, I took beginning band and I was in the band, so I was in the marching band. So I will say that, that that's one reason I, I, I graduated and completed high school. But in college, I wanted to try some different student government. And, um, and then I ran into this group called MASA, Mexican American Student Association, that was started by the older uh, Chicanos coming back from uh, the military and the GI Bill. So I started going to the meetings. I go, what's all this masa about? You know, the name masa, obviously masa used to make uh, tamales and tortillas. So I told him, why are you using that name? And I kind of confronted them. What's up? What's going on? What are you guys doing here? I'm with student government. We got all these clubs. We're doing car shows. We're doing concerts. What's masa about, right? And then uh, they said, well, we're going to be tutoring uh, students. We're going to do scholarship uh, fundraising. And um, so, but, I, but I, I, I confronted them as to why they were using the name MASA, you know, and the name. It, it was just a white sheet of paper I saw on a, on a door, a Mexican, a MASA, come to a meeting. So I went to the meeting. But it, what happened to me that during that, that confrontation with them, it kind of like, it, it, I don't know what you call it, uh, but it kind of like uh, clicked, I guess, you know, uh, or to use one of those old terms I used to say, it didn't blow my mind, but it made me click that, you know what, they got something here. You're right. They're trying to help Mexican Americans, which is us. They're doing this education thing. So I started going to the meetings, but since I was younger, I was more, uh, you know, I started telling them, look, we, we got to do what the blacks are doing. Because I, I grew up during the Watts Rebellion, 65, I was a janitor at an elementary school, so I hung out and worked with the blacks. And the blacks were arguing, you know, one guy was saying, yeah, we got to rebel, we got to burn, and the other black was saying, no, we can't do that, and I was like listening to them, right? And uh, that was 65. So later on, you know, the, during the Black Power Movement uh, and Malcolm X and and King, uh, that influenced me, you know, watching everything on TV and, and the news. 
So I, I would tell the older Chicanos, we got to be like the blacks. We can't just be doing tutoring and raising money to, to scholarships. And then finally one time I think they got fed up with me and they go, why don't you do that? And they looked at me and then I go, you know what? Okay, you're right. I'll go do it. <laughs> so I formed another organization called La Vida Nueva. Mm -hmm. Ended up, you know, I, I did stick it out in Massa for a while and try to make it more active. You know, let's take on the anti-war movement. Let's talk about ethnic studies. And they didn't want to move. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. So we formed another group called La Vida Nueva. And we took on the issue of the war in Vietnam, uh, struggle for Chicano studies, and uh, demanding more Chicanos uh, go to East L.A. College, because back then it was uh, 60, 70 percent white. Mm -hmm. And uh, being there in, in East L.A., you know. So, um, so, that, so that, I think, you know, that, that was part of my, my uh, beginning of my involvement in the Chicano movement. Uh, during the same time, I got a job as a team post director in Lincoln Heights. And uh, in Lincoln Heights, uh, you had Father John Luce, who was the, uh, at the Church of the Epiphany, Episcopalian Parish, who had brought in Eliasar Risco to publish the newspaper La Raza. So I was working with the street kids, you know, taking them to the beach, to concerts, and working with them. And they would always tell me, oh, we're getting harassed by the police, the schools are no good. Um, and um, I remember one time Father Luz and Risa Risco walked in with a stack of La Raza newspaper. And he told me, here, pass them out, you know. And I said, well, let me read it first. You know, I started reading it. I go, whoa, what is this stuff, you know. It, were, it was La Raza newspaper and criticizing the, the government, the city, the war on poverty, articles about the farm workers. So I really got turned on. I go, yeah, let's, let's distribute it. Have you, you know? read anything like that before? No, no, no. I think the most I had done, I think in 66 or early 67, I had gone to a meeting at the Casa del Mexicano in Ball Heights where they had a... Uh, they had Dr. Julian Nava speaking, who was running for the school board. Sal Castro, a teacher, was speaking, and also Pat, Patricio Sanchez. So I was in the audience, you know, I was at ELAC. I said, what are these guys talking about? You know, this guy wants to run. It kind of made sense. Okay, this guy wants to run the school board. And he ended up winning, because later on we had to work with him in the walkouts. So, you know, I, I was getting, uh, uh, I guess, ex exposed to political activism. Uh, when I was in La, in La Masa, I invited uh, Bert Corona, who was with Mexican American Political Association, to talk about the war in Vietnam. So I can get Masa to take a position against the war. And they still wouldn't do it. That's why I ended up forming La Vida Nueva. Mm -hmm. So La Vida Nueva was more uh, uh, activist oriented, more. Uh, direct action. Mm -hmm. So even in your first involvements, you had a sense of a number of different issues, it sounds like, the war mm -hmm. um, other, and some other issues. Yes, like yes. In the beginning, yeah. it, it was, you know, going to school, education, right? Mm -hmm. But then in, in, the, uh, in the, um, the, the, the issue with the war is that we found out that a lot of the people I grew up with in high school were getting drafted mm -hmm. and sent to Vietnam and coming back dead. Now, I had a student deferment uh, because I was at East L.A. College. So, you know, they they giving you a, right. But, uh, but I saw what was going on and then, you know, what was going on, on in Vietnam, the killings and the bombings. So, and then, um, so coming to the next organizations that you formed then, that then started to move towards the Brown Berets. Right, right. right. Okay, right. so I was talking about La Vida Nueva right. and my involvement at the Teen Post, where I got mm -hmm. exposed to uh, Father John Luce's Church of the Epiphany. So I started going to meetings of the Church of the Epiphany. He had helped organize a group of young Chicanos called Young uh, Citizens for Community Action, YCCA. And they were more like a, like a civic uh, uh, or organization, but uh, they made the transition, or we made the transition to young Chicanos for community action, right? And then the radical transition to uh, starting a, a coffee house called La Piranha Coffee House. Have you heard about that before, La, Gloria, La Piranha? Okay, good. First, uh, really being introduced 
to La Parana yeah. Coffee yeah. House, yeah. which is 67. Yeah. Right. So then, uh, yeah, the, the, the Young Chicano for Community Action got a small grant from, I think, the Council of the Churches, National Council of Churches, through the help of Father John Luce. Now, Father John Luce was very instrumental. He wanted to to lay the basis for some kind of organizing among Chicanos in, in the east side, which included Lincoln Heights, Boyle Heights, East L.A. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, right, La Piranha Coffee House, we opened it up in East L.A. at the corner of uh, Olympic and Goodrich, and uh, it was a big sign outside, La Piranha, and we started having meetings, uh, concerts, hanging out, young people hanging out, and we started getting uh, harassed by the sheriffs, you know, raiding us, lining us up against the wall, searching us, harassing us, no arrest yet, following us, giving us tickets for whatever reason. And um, the first issue we took up, one of the first issues we took up was the harassment of the cruising and the car clubs on Waiter Boulevard. Since I grew up doing that, I understood it. And uh, we, we started passing out flyers on uh, Waiter Boulevard, know your rights. Hmm. They can't stop you for any reason. They can't search you. And we started, we held a rally on one of the uh, gas stations there and the sheriffs came and ad arrested David Sanchez. And um, so we started doing that anti-police abuse campaign. And then it escalated when there was a young man found uh, dead in the East LA Sheriff's substation. Now, they alleged that he had hung himself, but according to the news and the lawyer, he had been beaten. So we did a pro our first open protest was to uh, protest the killing of a young Chicano. We said it was a killing of a young Chicano at the East LA Sheriff's Substation. So we, we had a picket line in front of the Sheriff's Station. The Sheriff's came out, started blocking us, trying to provoke us. We told everybody, just keep cool. They're trying to get you to get arrested. But we made the news, you know, the local news. And we were accused of being outsiders, um, agitators, uh, communists, outside agitators. And we said, what are you? I live here in East L.A., you know. You know, we live here. We're in the school here, you know, Garfield High School. I graduated from Garfield. Mm -hmm. And um, but we saw and people back then denied there's no such thing as police brutality. It was a total denial of it. So that was our first kind of uh, coming out. Be besides the, the Paraña Coffee House. And then you'll have different versions of how the name came about but, and who brought a stack of brown berets to one of the meetings. One time we passed them out, started wearing a brown beret, and, and people started calling us the brown berets. And uh, eventually we formalized it and we said we are the brown berets. Mm -hmm. And then we started putting out a newspaper, like a Gausa newspaper. First we wrote for the, for the Gausa newspaper. We'd write articles for it, distribute it. Mm -hmm. Then we came out with our own newspaper. We started. Um, and to, may I ask in yeah, terms of strategy, you know, as you're as you're building this and you're looking, I assume, at um, other organizations and other struggles. What strategies were you picking and choosing? Because you talked about the sort of. The, I was interested when you were talking about the first demonstration. You know, were you adopting nonviolence? Were you also looking at black power and thinking maybe there's a different way of approaching this? Yeah, we, we didn't formally analyze and sit down tactics. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we did the rally on Winter Boulevard. We did, we flyered on Winter Boulevard to the car club. We met with the car clubs, actually, and we made a presentation to them to talk about organizing, fighting back. And we found out, though, that the sheriffs had been there right before us to tell them that we were a bunch of communists and troublemakers. So the only ones that took our side were the more uh, rowdy or militant car clubbers. You know, they met with us later on. He goes, hey, the sheriffs were here before, <laughs> you know, tell us. And if we agree with you guys, you know. And uh, so, you know, we were organizing in our community. Um, you know, we didn't sit down and get training on what is organizing. We, we just started doing it out of the, our own initiative. And, uh, you know, we would, I did, and we did get influenced by the black liberation movement, what we read about and what we saw on TV and news. But eventually the, um, the Black Panthers did come to East LA to the Piranha Coffee House to meet with us. Mm -hmm. And Bunchy Carter and John Huggins came to the Piranha Coffee House to talk about working together and invited us to go to their office. And we were go over there, you know. 
So we stressed the black and brown unity. And, uh, you know, based on, on how they dressed, I think that influenced us. You know, they, they, they wore a black leather jacket, the black beret. So we had the brown beret. Now, why did we pick the brown beret? Because brown, we started, uh, you know, uh, the other part of this whole the, the ideology behind it. We started acknowledging that, that there was this strong racism in the United States against brown people, against black people, against Chicanos, Mexican-Americans, right? So we said, be brown, be proud, brown pride. So the brown beret is, you know, because of brown pride. And then also to be, a, to, to put out a more militant approach that we did not believe in nonviolence. We did not advocate violence, but we believed in self-defense. So the brown beret 13 point program, if you've had a chance to look at it, uh, talked about uh, self-defense, self-determination, uh, you know, education, uh, freeing uh, the Chicano prisoners, note of the war. is a, is a pretty um, long list of, of demand, but the main theme was self-determination for Chicanos. So we started taking on a more of a, of a, we went from a civil rights organization, the transition from the Young Chicanos for Community Action to La Paraña, the Brown Berets, we became more of a, um, uh, I think, direct action, more of a, uh, uh, the other thing, thing I can, we were different from the, from the prior generation, the GI Forum, the League of United Latin American Citizens, the old CSO, they were talking about assimilation and integration. So we said no, we made a break. We said we don't want to assimilate, we want self-determination, and, and, and they were, caught up in saying uh, that we were white and we should be white and integrate. We were saying, no, we're not white, we're brown, we're indigenous, we don't want to be part, we want to be our own, our own people, uh, self-determination. So all of that was, was a political and cultural um, uh, renaissance, revolution, or revolt. And tactics, you know, we believed that we needed to protest. So the, 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 uh, the, um, by learning our history, by looking at the Black Liberation Movement, so the 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 first picket at the police station, then we started taking on the issue of education. Since we all grew up in the local high schools, I was the only one of the Bromberets who had gone to college. Was going in college. If you look at David and and Gloria and Ralph and Cruz, Cruz had been in the in Vietnam had come back. But we were all poor working class Chicanos. Our parents were working class and poor. And uh, I was one of the ones that, you know, first generation from Mexico. Dave and some of the other ones had already been here for a while, their parents, and they didn't know English, Spanish as well as I did. Mm -hmm. So I saw that difference, but what brought us together was unity and pride in being brown, and then we started using the word Chicano, not Mexican hyphen American or Latin American. And so the tactics was that we needed to protest like the blacks. So we took on the issue of the organizing a massive high school walkouts in East LA. So two things, but did, did you use the term Chicano earlier in your life or does that? I would hear my point? dad say it. Yeah. My dad would say Chicanos and he would also say uh, La Raza. So I heard it from him. So to us, you know, uh, we liked it, identified it, with it because we prefer it to the hyphenation or Latin American. So it was our, our term of, uh, of uh, self-identification, self-affirmation, pr pride. So it was there earlier, but you really started to use it in this determined Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. We started popularizing the Chicano power, Chicano uh, movement. Before it was there, you know, with our parents, but it wasn't, it, it was popularized during the 60s, the Chicano power movement. Well, how, am I so, how am I doing? Fantastic. So, we're, kind of, we're kind of getting it. We're going to get it into we're it. Getting, yeah, we're yeah. getting there. We're getting there. We're getting, so, getting the good question, yeah. though. Good question. You oh, got okay. those good questions. Well, you, you, you already just set me up for the next question, which was about the school walkouts. So um, can you tell us about the, the origin of the Chicano blowouts or Chicano walkouts? As... Yes. Okay, conditions in the East L.A. high schools were really bad. Overcrowded conditions, high dropout rate. Uh, you know, lack of uh, ethnic studies, uh, uh, old facilities, um, 
antiquated facilities, lack, lack of, uh, an emphasis on industrial arts and the military, right? I, I remember when I turned 18 at Garfield High School, they called me into the AP's office, and I go, oh, oh, what happened, what's going on? And they had me sign for the selective service. Yeah, I was saying, why, why would the school do that? You know, well, you're 18, you gotta sign up. Oh, man, you know. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I didn't like that, you know, but I didn't start rebelling till later on. Later on, I would start objecting to everything when I was in now. Uh, in the Brown Berets, but um, so um, so what happened is that we started having meetings at the Paranya Coffee House, at the Church of the Epiphany with students and teachers, especially Sal Castro, and they were starting a, a series of student uh, committees that were set up in Garfield, Roosevelt, Lincoln, and Wilson to start talking about educational issues. There were surveys done about the needs, and uh, these surveys were presented to the school board, to Julian Nava that I mentioned earlier. I go, okay, he won, right? And nothing was done, nothing was done. So we started, um, what I use the word now, agitating, but back then I would say leafletting, outre doing outreach, going to schools, passing out flyers, criticizing the conditions, and then just popularizing the word walkout. And then, you know, it created a kind of tension and controversy. What's this? What's all this walkout? This went on for months, you know, like the dropout rate. And we would, sh we would show pictures, cartoons of the schools as prisons. Because they would literally lock the restrooms, lock the gates to get in and out. Did the student, were the students immediately responsive or were they kind of hesitant? This idea of, oh... Some, no, some were, were down. Some were very open to it. So we would give them flyers. They would pass them out. Some were not, you know, and we had parents that were against us. We, I remember going to a meeting at Garfield High School where the principal had, had organized the meeting to talk about these flyers and what's going on, you know, and what's this rumor about a walkout and conditions. But it, what it was really the principal and the VP, AP rather, talking about what they're doing, how great Garfield is, and I'm sitting there, no, nah, no, nah, this is not true. I went to Garfield. I barely graduated, you know. And so um, we walked into that meeting. We took, I told everybody, take off your brown berets. We're going to walk in there. And, and then uh, and, and I could see it was kind of like a public relations meeting, that things are fine. So I started asking questions. What about the dropout rate? What about the, what about the library? The library is really old. You know, and what about this and, and this? And then the, 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 the assistant principal remembered me. So he called me out by name. Oh, Carlos, I hear what you're saying, you know, but you know, we're working on things and things are better. And, um, but you know, and then some parents, you know, uh, that were, that were uh, raised their hands and they, we want to know what's going on. If somebody's talking about doing a walkout, we just kept quiet though. You know, we didn't want to say, yeah, we're going to do a walkout. <laughs> So this went on for months, you know, it was popularizing the idea that the, the conditions of schools are bad. There were student strike committees set up in all the major high schools in East L.A. Went to community meetings, went to board meetings, uh, and the students presented a set of demands to the school board, and the school board said we're going to study them. So as to who or what, who called the walkouts, you know, everybody takes claim for that, right? But I remember going to the meeting on, on uh, I think it was February, the, uh, March the 5th, uh, on a night, night time. I went to the Church of the Epiphany in the basement. I met with El Azarisco, me and a couple of our brown berets. And he goes, look, tomorrow, he goes, oh, we want to do something. Are you down? I go, yeah, what are we going to do? What are we gonna do? He said, why don't you guys go to Lincoln High School and run in there at 10 o'clock and start yelling, walk out. And I go, okay, sure. We, you know, you're like 20 years old. You're, you're not going to like. Nowadays, somebody tells me that. I go, wait a minute. What's the plan? You're going to call the media? You know, you're going to call parents, right? So me and this other guy, I said, okay, we're down for that. You know, we, I didn't realize that um, the students had already been meeting and had talked about walking out at 10 o'clock, March the 6th. So, um, but remember, it was uh, all this groundwork had been laid before, right? So, uh, yeah, the next day, March 6 at 10 a.m., I ran into Lincoln High School straight up the front uh, quad into the main admin building, and me and this other guy named Richard Vigil started yelling, walk out. I had my beret on, and uh, I'm trying to remember if we had our patch by then. I think we did. No, maybe not. 
but we, we started yelling, walk out, you know, and then uh, teachers came out, students, what's going on? This is the one? Yeah, this is it, this is the one. And then a, a, an administrator came out. They said, what are you doing? You're trespassing, get out of here. And I go, look, this is serious, we're doing a walkout. No, you can, yes, we can. <laughs> so then, you know, before you know it, thousands of students, you know, started to come out of the, all the different buildings, mm -hmm. marching out, it was beautiful, marching, coming out of, of Lincoln High School on Broadway, North Broadway Street. And, and there's pictures of, of us marching up and down our, uh, Broadway and, and rallying in front of the, the school, students getting on top of cars, you know, and posters with Chicano power, education, all the main demands. We wanted equitable education, Chicano studies, bilingual education, uh, better facilities, more schools. And that went on for two weeks. So did you present the demands in a formal way? Uh, not not that day, not okay. that day. Right. It was it was. I don't recall. We did it later on at the school board. But what what happened? The school board started having meetings and and, and discussions. We marched to a local school board uh, district office. But since you know our job was to to get the other schools out. Right after Lincoln started, then we ran over to Roosevelt High School. By the time we got to Roosevelt High School, they had already chained up the gates, the front gates, the, the side gates. So we couldn't get in. So we were on the, the Mott Street side of Roosevelt where there was a driveway with a gate and the students were trying to push out and come out. They were like bunched up, pushing, pushing. I told them, just push, push. And one of them threw a rope out. And then it's here, pull on. So we tied it to the, to the gate and we started pulling on one side and they kept pushing and eventually the, the, the chain popped. The chain popped open and the gates, you know, flew open and oh, the whole flood of students came out. I go, oh my God. <laughs> I was like, and I turned around kind of like catching my breath and there was a guy across the street with a white shirt and a tie with a big camera taking photographs. We find out later on that was a police photographer. So I have a, that little photo, I have a photo of that. So, um, you know, so there was two weeks. We went to uh, Garfield, we went to Belmont. Wilson had already started walking out. Uh, they, they, they started on their own. So for two weeks, students walked, walked out in March to local district uh, schools. We, had, we went to down to the school board to present the demands, and we wanted Julian Nava, who was our Chicano, you know, to fight for us. And he did okay, but we, he, I thought he could have done a lot more. So, um, you know, the Sal Castro was uh, suspended because he was a teacher at uh, Lincoln High School. He was eventually fired, but then the whole campaign to reinstate him took on, that took on months to get him back. Um, and that was a victory. There was a sit-in at the school board that went on for, uh, for days uh, as part of the de demands. So eventually, you know, we, we, we started getting more Chicano teachers hired, more Chicano administrators. They did have uh, Mexican American studies. They had a plan to open another high school. In 1972, there was a brand new high school built in East LA called the new Wilson High School. The old one became a middle school. So we, you know, we made victory, we made gains. We, we uh, started uh, even, um, you know, having ethnic, uh, Mexican American studies, even Mexican food started being served, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, bilingual programs started uh, being implemented and more of an emphasis on college uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. So were you, and you, were you still in school yourself at this point? Okay, this is 16. Now, I was uh, part-time at, at, at East LA College. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because... Yeah, I'm just wondering how you were getting by, like how, you know, how, well, do, how do young revolutionaries support themselves? Yeah, you know, I don't even remember how we, we didn't eat, we didn't eat, we didn't sleep, we didn't have a, you know, we didn't have any uh, cell phones or car, let's say I had a car, That's a, we, I, I had the job as a team post director for a while, so I saved a little money on that, and then, uh, well at that time I still lived with my parents, there I was right there, I lived with my parents, so, um, and how were your parents uh, reacting to, to this? Well, they, they were acting pretty good, but later on, you know, when the police harassment started, my mother be, 
started becoming uh, preoccupied or concerned with my safety, and she would tell me that. Now, the thing with my dad, he was a union steward in the carpenter's industrial section. And when I was a young man in elementary school, I forgot to mention that he took me to a union meeting, like a picket line during the strike. I remember the union meeting was so exciting. All these young, uh, all these, not these young, but all these um, older men uh, arguing and yelling. Hey, this is exciting. It's a union meeting. You know? so you'd seen sort of a model for some of this. Yeah. What's that? You'd seen sort of a model for some of this organizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Unions. yeah, the unions, absolutely, absolutely. I remember to get in the union meeting, you have to have a password, so they gave me the password. We're <laughs> back. <laughs> okay, so you started to taste a little bit of victory and some motion forward, and then. In the whole educational yeah. field, right. Yeah. We, we made some gains, we made some victories because of the walkout, direct pressure. I will say that everyone was shocked that young uh, Mexican-American Chicano kids would walk out. It, you know, they, they, they labeled us the sleeping giant woke up. It made national news that, that uh, these massive high school walkouts, and it's part of our history. You know, they, they became uh, popularized. It's a tactic now that's used throughout uh, the United States, uh, throughout the Southwest. Uh, it um, started uh, having walkouts in, in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado that same year. And then the tactic is even used in, during the immigrant rights struggle in uh, 2006, where 40,000 students walked out on February the 20, excuse me, on March 27 in California. So uh, we made gains, but one of the things that did happen, there was a secret grand jury convened by uh, D.A. Evel Younger. And I say secret grand jury because uh, they took testimony. We didn't have the right to be there or have attorneys to hear the testimony or cross-examine. So they had police, they had alleged witnesses, photographs, and they came out with an indictment, grand jury indictment, to arrest 13 of us. We became known as the East LA 13. The main charges were conspiracy to disrupt the peace, conspiracy to disrupt the school system. There was over a a half a dozen charges. They were all felonies. When you disrupt the peace or disrupt the school, it's a misdemeanor. But when you conspire to do that, it becomes a felony. So these are all felonies. And there was, I said, over uh, you know six different felonies, a variety. They threw the book at us. <laughs> and this was all the organizers of the walkout. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, okay, the majority were were, were the Brown Berets. You know, there was, uh, but also Sal Castro, and an adult uh, Patricio Sanchez, uh, Mangas Coloradas. No women were arrested, and no priests. And. Um, you know, it was Carlos Montes, uh, Ralph Ramirez, David Sanchez, Fred Gomez, Cruz Olmeda, uh, Sal Castro, Eliasar Risco, Pat Sanchez. Uh, did I say Sal Castro? There were 13 of us. I, I forgot a couple of names. I wonder who they are. So they called, we, it was funny that they, it was 13 people. So we used it, the East LA 13. The number 13 is, is popular in, in East L.A., you know, 13, 13. A lot of uh, different gangs or groups will use the, the number 13. Um, like, you know, when I grew up in, in South L.A., the gang there, Florencia 13, Florence 13 gang. Yeah. So it was funny that they used 13, they arrested 13. Now, the only thing is that we were already, I was in Washington, D.C. during the Poor People's Campaign. So we were super active in 1968, right? The police brutality issues, the walkout issues. We get an invitation, uh, you know, Eliasar Risco from La Raza says, hey, come here, I want to talk to you. There's a Poor People's Campaign in D.C. There's a bus leaving South L.A., you know, tomorrow morning. You want to <laughs> go? I think we're that same day, I forget. And he said, yeah, we want to go <laughs> or go get down to that bus. Just grabbed some clothes, took some newspapers. We get down there, the bus was about to leave. We made it a point. It was me, Ralph, uh, David, I don't know if Gloria was there, a couple of us, uh, forget the exact delegation. We made it a point, we walked down the bus. We were in South Central LA. We're going to go to the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. Gloria, so, solidarity. Gloria, huh? Gloria was there because she told she us. She was there? She said that? Did yeah. she say that story? Yeah, she told that, yeah. 
Yeah, I won't ruin the, what no. happens at the back of the bus. Yeah. You won't ruin what? Well, it's not always so good to be in the back of the bus sometimes. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, because of the restroom? Or what? <laughs> yeah, that's what, <laughs> that's what she was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but we were like, we wanted to be in solidarity with Black, right, you know. Right. And remember, I, I um, when I was in South LA, I grew up with Blacks. Mm -hmm. When I was in middle school, Edison Middle School, there was 50% Black and Chicanos. So to me, you know, when I moved to Ball Heights in East LA, the Black Panthers started coming over. I thought it was a natural to have black and brown unity, even though there were some blacks in, in the Black Panthers and some Chicanos in the Berets who didn't want it, who were, had prejudice, right, that we had to fight. So, yeah, we got on the bus. We got on the bus. And uh, it was like a couple of weeks of, uh, I think our first stop was Phoenix, I think. Was it Yuma or Phoenix, Arizona? And we had a stop, had dinner, had a rally and a march. Every city along the way, there would be a rally or a march. It, it, was, it was really awesome, I would say. You know, it was an experience for me and the rest of the Berets because we were being exposed to other races, other cities, other conditions, to see that there was poor people all over and there were Chicanos along the Southwest. When we were in El Paso, Texas, my hometown, I realized the more blatant racism of the sheriffs, the police there you know, yelling at it, you better stay in the Coliseum and, you know, you guys can't come out, you know, being very uh, overly uh, aggressive, more so than the East L.A. sheriffs. They said, we're, and we told, I told everybody, we're in Texas, so we better watch out. And, but every city, we, we had the solidarity of the host committees, you know, feeding us, housing us. Um, How did that feel to, to sort of see so clearly that the, the, this was bigger, that this is a bigger movement? No, it started, it started to show me that it was a big movement, a big movement of poor people, a multiracial movement, you know, because I started to see Native Americans in Arizona join the, the troop. And then, uh, you know, Chic uh, uh, Chicanos from uh, uh, campesinos or, or farmers from New Mexico joined us. You know, and I go, wow, you know, this is the real thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not just farm workers who work the field, but people who actually had a small little ranch, sheep herders and ranching, right? Uh, peasants, small, small farmers, mm -hmm. small ranchers, and who were fighting to recover the land, to take back the land. Now, that, that's another thing I want to point out that in June of 67, Reyes Tijerina and a group of members of the Alliance of Free City States, or Alianza Federal de Mercedes, led a raid in Tierra Maria, where they went to arrest the district attorney for violating their rights. And they resisted, so there was a shootout. So it was the raid on Tierra Maria that was shot, heard worldwide. And in East LA, it made a major impact on us. Where we, where I politically changed, uh, made a political uh, transformation. I guess you could say that uh, that this is not just for education, stop police abuse. This is for our land. This is for our nation. This is for self determination. So that was a major um, mm -hmm. political uh, revolution in in our uh, in our minds of the Brown Berets. This is for Chicano power. This is not just for civil rights. This is for a revolution, and uh, you know we started studying uh, the, the revolutionary movements in Mexico, primarily Zapata and Villa, and then we started hearing about uh, Cuba and and uh, and the um, the Vietnamese people made a big impact on me that this poor peasant economy was fighting the U.S. Army, the U.S. military, and eventually defeated it, right? And that uh, they wanted self determination, they wanted socialism. So we started getting influenced by the more leftist, radical uh, uh, um, examples. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that the Black Panthers uh, were the ones that first gave me the red book, Mao, Mao Zedong's little red book. You know, at first we thought it was kind of cute, you know. <laughs> but we, we started reading it. It sounds pretty nice, you know. We made a joke about it, Mousy, you know, because we had nicknames. In East LA, Chicanos have nicknames for everybody, Louie, Little Louie, and... Chewy and Freddy, and, and then we said, Mousy, Mou Mousy, you know, oh, Mousy tongue, Mousy says this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, 
but you know the uh, the Chinese Revolution. Uh, we didn't study study it in depth. The, the major impact to me was the Vietnamese, the Black Liberation Movement, and then you know stories from my mom that my grandfather was in the Mexican Revolution. I met my my grandfather. We would go back to Mexico every year when we were young, and I would talk to my da my grandfather. He showed me his gun, his sombrero. He had a a wooden leg that he had been shot and he had amputated his leg so he had a, a wooden, uh, not, a, not a whole leg, just a, a, a what do you call it, a, a wood uh, uh, peg, leg. A peg leg, peg leg, peg leg, yeah. there you go. But I could tell he was a real strong, you know, uh, man. So um, where was I at? The transformation part? Yeah. The, the, so we got arrested. We're moving across the, the, we're moving the, across the Poor People's Campaign. Yeah. Yeah. We get to uh, Albuquerque and we meet the, the farm workers, the people that took over the land or fought for the land. Mm -hmm. Then we get to D Denver, Colorado. We see all the families where the Brownberries was young men and women. Mm -hmm. We get to the Crusade as well as the Alianza. They were the whole family were members. You know, the mom, the dad, the kids, or like that. And we like that, that approach, that organizational approach. We were mostly young Chicanas, Chicanos, but we, we liked that. And then, and then after we left the Southwest, we started uh, picking up uh, poor working class whites and blacks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to remember uh, Missouri, I forget what comes after Colorado. My memory's starting to, <laughs> to fade a little bit, yeah, but I remember being in Louisville, Kentucky. You know, we've, all we could remember the, the, the derbies, we went down to a racetrack and marched around the racetrack. And after a while, I said, what the hell are we doing a racetrack? There's nobody here anyway. You know, we were just trying different stuff. You were young, right. young and, and uh, down for something, right? Mm. And then, um, what else? So then... Uh, well, what about some of the other personalities, that, the, the people, the other leaders from the other communities, like, um, like Corky Gonzalez? Right, right. Well, we got to meet them, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we got to interact. I mean, they were in different buses, right? And, okay. and then, uh, but, but once we got to D.C., we really got to meet them closely and watch them in action and learn from them and get to know them. You know, Corky Gonzalez, uh, you know, uh, a real respected leader from Denver, Colorado. We found out that he had been a boxer, a businessman. He had been in the Democratic Party, had tried that, and he gave it up. He said, you know, we got to build our own organizations. Uh, and they had, a, you know, uh, hundreds of members, the whole families were there. And then, of course, uh, uh, Tijerina, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Alianza Federal, the, 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 the farm owners, you know. I, I don't want to use farm workers because they, they, they owned their little farm and they, they worked it. And um, the Native Americans that came with us, the Navajos, so it, it, it really uh, opened my mind up to see that this was a wider struggle. And then, the, and then in, in, uh, in Virginia and Appalachia, we, the poor whites that joined us, you know, that uh, they were really poor, you know, in education and, and jobs and housing. So I, see, I realized that this was a struggle not against the white man or the honky. It was a struggle against the system, the corporate system, the rich people against the poor people but that blacks and Chicanos had a particular uh, a demand for self-determination. So in D.C., what, in was DC. The, what was the scene? Every day was a big protest, you yeah. know. Yeah, the, the ones I remember were marching on the U.S. Supreme Court, supporting the uh, Native American rights for land, water, fishing. We were, we, every day we would support a different issue, different struggle. And marching up the U.S. Supreme Court, I remember we were marching up there with the Native Americans leading it and with blacks, Chicanos, and whites. And as soon as we got up to the door, out, or up the stairs, we saw that the police closed these big, giant doors. Boom! It was so symbolic that as soon as we got there, they closed the, the, the big doors to the Supreme Court. And the Native Americans started banging on the door. And we decided to to do a sit-in, and we did a sit-in that whole day all around the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. And um, I remember marching on the, uh, they used to have a Department of Health, Education, Welfare, where uh, Jesse Jackson led that march. We were gonna raise the issue of food for poor people, food and jobs. 
And the tactic I thought was really, uh, really great because we all marched into the building and they said, we're all going to go to the cafeteria and we're going to get our tray of food and go to the cashier. And Jesse said, everybody just go through and don't pay. I'll be the last one. So we said, well, all right, let's do it. Let's go. We're going to get some food. And then what he did at the very end, he said, we're not going to pay as a protest to poor people, that we demand food for all poor people in the United States. So it was a, it was a protest, just civil disobedience. So I started learning all these tactics, and I started, uh, we started, you know, the Brown Berets. Wow, a lot of things we could do. We, um, we did a mar another march uh, where we got attacked by the uh, Washington, D.C. police. I forget which one we were, or Ernesto Vigil, I think, was arrested. And um, we stayed at, uh, you know, every day was a different march, you know. And what started happening is uh, the, I started to see that the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, the leaders were sometimes apprehensive of what we wanted to do. We wanted to be more militant, more direct action. And uh, I, I remember that, you know, that Martin Luther King had invited the participation of the Chicano movement. So he could, uh, the, which was the original idea of the Rainbow Coalition. The original Rainbow Coalition have Chicanos, have Native Americans, whites, and blacks. And then that was in, in February and March, and he was assassinated. So, um, you know, they remember that, that the Crusade, the Brown Berets, and the uh, Alianza did not believe in uh, peaceful nonviolence tactics. Mm -hmm. So I know that some of the lieutenants, like Reverend Abernathy, were concerned about that. But we, you know, but he couldn't renege on the invitation of King, so we, 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 were, we were in the march, and we pushed the envelope many times. You know, the young people, them Chicanos and black, we started getting a, a little... Um, uh, what should I say, uptight with the older leadership. Mm -hmm. And we said, we're going we we to do our own march. So we went with the young people, we're going to do our own march. Because there were marches every day. So then we said, we're going to do our own march for youth, for young people, for education, for jobs, for young, respect young people. So we recruited blacks, Native Americans, Chicanos, and we're going to march on the White House. Yeah, right. And then the, Evernathy and them said, no, no, you know, no, don't, what are you guys doing? You should do it. So they... They sent some of the Chicano elders to talk to us, and they didn't try to talk us out of it directly, but I knew that's what they wanted us to do, not to do it. But we, we, we respectfully said, we're going to do it. They said, okay, go do it. You know, we got our ass kicked. <laughs> we got arrested. So we marched on the White House. We marched on the White House. We wanted to have a meeting with uh, LB. Was LBJ? Was that LBJ back then? I forget. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Marched on the White House. We yeah. marched in the White House. As soon as we got there, um, we got attacked. We got outmaneuvered. We had the the White House security in the front. I don't know if there was White House security. They weren't Secret Service. They didn't look like because they were wearing uniforms and hats. And then they confronted us. But then to the back, it was the Washington D.C. police. So they they got us. <laughs> they just pushed us down, beat us up you know, put our hands way up or to our neck and pain up and picked us up and literally picked us up and threw us in the paddy wagon. Mm -hmm. But one thing I will notice, I, I got abused and hit, but I didn't bleed. But the young black guy was bleeding on his head. He popped him in the head. You know, I always noticed the difference for blacks. They always made it worse. And then um, we had already been there for a month and a half, two months, I think. So I went to court got bailed out, so um, ask me another question. There's a, lot, a whole lot of stuff happened mm -hmm. over there. So where were you staying? You were staying? We were at the Hawthorne. Was it Hawthorne School? Yeah, the school. Yeah, right? Hawthorne School. Yeah, we were okay. staying at Hawthorne School. That's where all the Chicanos and Native Americans uh, were staying there. Um, and you, did you go down to, to Resurrection City? We did. We, we, we were down to Resurrection City. We yeah. would go down there. We, we, yeah. would, uh, we didn't stay there, you know, and, and later on when it started, raining and flooding and getting hot and we were saying man good thing we didn't stay here because they got flooded right, right and it was really crowded um but we would go there you know we would go down there and have meetings with the blacks and the other groups mm -hmm. so we met a whole lot of different organizations we met puerto ricans we met blacks from different organizations different cities uh whites from the south and appalachia native americans it was a, um, a major learning experience. 
And what do you think, I mean, this might not be a, an easy one to answer, but what do you think the effects were on the Brown Berets of having participated? Well, it, de it definitely uh, opened up our mind to see there was a wider struggle, wider struggle in the U.S. Before that, you know, we used to, to blame white racism and our oppression on the white man. The white man is the enemy, you know, the honky, the white man, the whitey, right? And to me, the, the, the beginning of the poor people experience and all of that changed to say it's not the white man, it's, it's the 1% the that's used nowadays or the corporate structure or the rich people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rich corporations uh, is the enemy that, that they monopolize and, and uh, they discriminate. So um, there was a major, um, I started seeing, I guess you could call it class analysis. It was a, the, the upper class and the working class. And um, that it was a wider struggle. It wasn't just L.A. or the Southwest. It was a national struggle. And even so that it was a wider, worldwide struggle, uh, the example of the Vietnamese, uh, Africa, Latin America, against the U.S. domination of their economies uh, politically and, and militarily, like in, in uh Puerto Rico or in Cuba, right? And uh, so, so it was, it was a uh, political transformation for me and, and many of the other Brown Berets. But I, I think not all the Brown Berets made that trans transformation. So in, just, I just want to get the chronology right in terms of the East LA 13 and then the Poor People's Campaign. Yeah. Okay. So you were indicted and... Well, we were indicted when we were in the Poor People's Campaign. We were in Washington, right. D.C. So you were there when the indictments came. Right. We had a meeting. Uh, Corky Gonzalez called us. He goes, hey, there's warrant out for your arrest. I go, what? For what? And he goes, you know, for something we did here. No, no, you guys got indicted. Uh, he got a call, telegram that, that back in L.A., uh, the grand jury had indicted us. And there was warrants out for the rest of myself and Ralph Ramirez, who was in D.C. And that the other people who had stayed in L.A., David Sanchez went to Arizona and he went back. He didn't go all the way on the trip. Mm. And, and, uh, and uh, Gloria Ariana wasn't indicted. Now, I don't remember how far she went on the trip. She was in D.C. for about three weeks and then okay. she went home. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then um, the other East L.A. 13... Their homes or businesses were raided and arrested. And they went on a hunger strike, and then they got bailed out, and it was rallies. We were in D.C., so we, we decided to go underground, semi-underground. We started taking our brown berets off. I think I may have shaved, you know. <laughs> and then um, we, we um, you know, we were fearful for being, getting arrested. We, know that the, we knew that the... Uh, Poor People's Campaign was being uh, uh, spied on by the local police and the FBI, and we suspect that there may have been infiltrators within the Poor People's Campaign. We never proved who it was. And, um, did you ever have infiltrators within the Brown Berets yes. themselves? Yes. Yes, we yes. did. We did. We did. We did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you want me to talk about that a little bit? Uh, no, absolutely. No, when we, okay, yeah. so then, uh, you know, so we stayed in D.C. for a while. I think we went to New York, came back, and then we met with uh, Puerto Rican uh, youth activist, and then uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference flew us back. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get all the the militant back, so we came back to L.A. We didn't stay in East L.A. We stayed like an Echo Park. We rented a, a room. We stayed on the ground. We were not going to turn ourselves in. And uh, what happened? Is one time uh, David Sanchez came to visit us, and his driver, uh, uh, Richard Avila, was an undercover cop, LAPD. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what he did, I don't know how he did it, uh, he came to see us, and then uh, evidently they were being followed by another cop, uh, Sergeant Lee Ceballos. They're with the Public Disorder Intelligence Division, PDID. So what happened when we got in the car to give us a ride, they stopped the car. The, the sergeant, the undercover sergeant, called the regular uh, LAPD patrol car and stopped us. And then they stopped us. And we were in the back seat and, and you know, we just say, don't say nothing, don't say nothing. Yeah, they already knew who we were. Mm -hmm. 
So they go, you're under arrest. Come on, you guys are under arrest. They go, what the hell? How the hell they knew? You know, we didn't know that the driver, the rich driver, was undercover cop. Mm. He had come and joined the Brown Berets. He said, I'm from Lincoln High School. He looked like a high school student, had a baby face. I'm from Lincoln. I want to join. Okay, great. Come on in. And he, he got really close to the Prime Minister, David Sanchez, and became his driver and his, you know, mm. little hanging out with him, you know. And um, <clears throat> I had noticed that um, after he had joined, he would always uh, criticize or contradict some of the things that I would say, we would say, you know, little things like we would, we would say, you know, uh, you know, we would criticize everything about the U.S., America, you know, apple pie, ah, apple pie is American, you know. He would say, well, I like apple pie, you know, like, <laughs> we should be eating Mexican food, you know, or, or you know, other pastries, you know, <laughs> or the American flag. Oh, there's nothing wrong with the American flag, you know, it's just 13 colonies. Oh, and later on, he was a cop, you know, he was spying on us. He was sent in by the Public Disorder Intelligence Division to gather intelligence. And then the sheriffs also sent in another guy called Robert Acosta. Now, him, they didn't change his name, Robert Acosta. That was his real name. Where Richard Avila, his real name was Richard, uh, Richard Avina. Yeah, and then um, what um, I don't remember when we discovered him. It must have been when we got out. We came back to L.A. We got bailed out. But one time we were at the Brumbury office, and uh, Hilda... And Gracie Reyes, the Brombray woman, I'm sure Gloria talked about them, came running, screaming to the office, hysterical. And I go, what happened? What's going on? I go, what are you talking about? And they said, they just hysterical, screaming, Richard the cop. I go, what are you talking about? He's over there at a local popular hamburger stand. We, we, we always ate on Soto and Chavez. So we, I said, what are you talking about? Let's go. So we walked over there. Let me go see what's going on. So I walked over there. There was four patrol cars with four cops all in uniform hanging out. And then I looked, and one of the guys was Richard, so-called Richard uh, Avila. Richard was in full uniform, just looking at us, smirking. Mm. So to me, they were like trying to blow our mind, doing what I call psychological warfare, just to show. But they did it again. Everybody was hysterical and shocked that this guy's a cop, man. All this time he was a cop, and here he is in full uniform with all these other cops because they figured we'd try to kick his ass or something. Mm -hmm. So they were there to protect him, and they stuck around for a while, then they left. So we became a little bit more paranoid. We started doing security checks on people. They sent in another guy to join, another guy, Fernando Sumaya. They used his real name. And because uh, we said, you know, they, they'll give you a fake name, they'll give you a fake uh, address or mm -hmm. fake identity. And he said he went to Calexico High School. So, f you know, Ralph called the school. Mm -hmm. and they go, yeah, he graduated from here. You know, he, so, we, okay, he's a real guy, you know. But he didn't, he should have asked them, where did you send the transcript? Send his transcript to the LAP. <laughs> Anyway, but this guy, you know, he had tattoos, long black hair, long mustache. He wore, you know, the, the kind of like the barrio get-up, the ghetto clothes, you know, but he was a cop. But, okay, so he joined. So then there were two at the same time. So then uh, the other guy, Richard, you know, transitioned out. Now this guy, Fernando Sumaya, he always had a gun, and he always advocated, let's go shoot up, let's go do stuff. So he was more of a provocateur. Mm. He would say, let's go shoot up the Safeway store because they're selling grapes. They're not boycotting grapes. Let's go firebomb them. He always wanted to do more stuff. You know, if anybody disagreed with us, whether the Chicano movement or the black movement, he'd, let's go shoot them. Let's go beat them up. And at first, I just thought he was a militant, young, tough guy. You know? mm. And I go, no, we, you know, we're not going to do that kind of stuff, you know. But eventually, uh, he did. He did. Uh, he did get a couple of guys uh, who had been to Vietnam, two Chicanos, uh, Al and Billy. Al Aceves, Billy Rivas had been to Vietnam. They were actually at Eighty Second Airborne, so they were down. He got them to go with them to go firebomb a Safeway, and they got caught. They they were waiting for them, the police. Um, but before that. He, he, he started some fires at the Biltmore Hotel during an educational conference 
called the Nuevas Vistas uh, Conference on Education, where Ronald Reagan, governor, was supposed to speak, mm -hmm. and Max Rafferty, uh, Secretary of Education. So we had had protests there. We were organized protests. And we found out about it because we know that he was against bilingual education. He was against social programs, the governor, Reagan. Right. So we had a picket line outside protesting. We had people inside during the speakers and started a, what we call a Chicano hand clap. We started clapping and disrupting the speeches. Mm -hmm. And we had meetings in the rooms to plan this stuff. Now, Sumaya was in those meetings. We had a meeting at East LA College with the Brown Berets and La Vida Nueva to plan the protest, and Mr. Fernando Sumail was, was there. Mm -hmm. So when we got to the, to the, to the Biltmore Hotel, there was police there, uh, there was firemen there, and there was also the state police, because of Reagan, right? So we did our protest. Fernando Sumaya, there were several fires set in the hotel. We don't know who set them. We know for a fact that he started one fire, a small fire in a restroom, right? And nobody get, uh, got arrested that day. The only people that got arrested was the people that disrupted the speeches mm -hmm. by getting up during the, the, the speaking uh, event. And these were all misdemeanors, and then they got bailed out, right? But it, it was sometime later that there was a second grand jury indictment mm -hmm. for conspiracy to commit arson. Yeah, yeah. And arrested 10 people, several Brown Berets, several professors and students. And uh, uh, the only uh, testimony or evidence they had was Fernando Sumaya saying these people mad, they had a, all these protests. That's the guy that started the fire. Right, yeah. right. Right, and then the first day in court, four people had the charges dropped. Boom, no evidence. They dropped everything. So that left six people. So that was the Biltmore Six that became the famous political case, the East LA 13, and then the Biltmore Six. And we had our famous attorney, Oscar Seta Acosta, known as the Brown Buffalo, who wrote the book uh, Revolt of the Cockroach People, was our attorney. And he challenged the constitutionality of the grand jury as being discriminatory because there were no Chicanos in it. And that's a long story, but we, we, we subpoenaed the judges to come to the to testify. We had oh, judges. Wow. We had Supreme Court judges. He was asking them, you know, how do you select who you nominate? And it was hilarious. The only one that knew anybody who was Chicano was one guy. Oh, I nominated one. Yeah. Well, how do you know him? Well, he's in my tennis club. And what's his name? Pancho Gonzalez, the tennis star, you know. He had nominated him to the, that was the only one, right? But other, but other than that, um, so, um, so, the, uh, so the Bill Moore 6 case was another famous case. Everyone was found not guilty eventually on that case. They went to trial. I was the last one. And, uh, but before I get into that part, give me another question, because that's, that's going to transition into me leaving the country. Well, you know, one of the other big issues we took on was the Vietnam War in Vietnam, because we found out that Dr. Ralph Guzman did a study out of UCLA mm -hmm. and showed that uh, Chicanos had a higher casualty rate uh, in Vietnam due to the fact that uh, we were put in the most dangerous positions, but higher casualty rate in relationship to our population from the Southwest, right? And, we, and that, you know, again, blew our mind. He said, wow, you know, so not only are we being drafted uh, and, uh, you know, not going to college, we're getting killed in higher numbers. Yeah. So what was popular back then was these anti-war moratoriums. We decided, let's do a Chicano moratorium. I remember going to a meeting at the Brombury office, and uh, David Sanchez brought up, let's do a Chicano moratorium. Now, I do know that, you know, Rosalio Munoz will also say that he had meetings and let's do a Chicano moratorium. So it's going to be a debate who, who started the, the idea of to have a Chicano moratorium, right? But the first one we organized was in December of 1969. We marched from Evergreen Park in Boyle Heights to Obregón Park in East L.A., and the issue was, uh, you know, protesting the high casualty rate of young Chicanos and, and the war in Vietnam. 
And, um, you know, I have a couple of photos. I think, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't know if we can transition. There's a fo couple of photos on the wall there of that march okay. in December of 69. We'll take a look at those at the yeah. end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it was a couple yeah. thousand people. Mm -hmm. We had a rally. And, and that was, you know, politically uh, creating a lot of awareness for us in the community. Because prior to that, they were trying to stereotype that Chicanos were all... Uh, uh, pro-war or, or Chicanos were, were uh, pro-military, mm -hmm. that we had a long history of being in the, in the military, and there was a book called Among the Valiant mm -hmm. by Marine about the Congressional Medal of Honor that Chicanos had won. Mm -hmm. So we said some of that may be true, but in, in this case, you know, we're saying no. You know, we're saying we're challenging. So we met a lot of resistance from, you know, uh, groups veterans groups, community groups, but little by little, you know, we were able to popularize that we were, being, we were being targeted by the draft and then we were being put in dangerous frontline positions and dying in higher numbers. And did you get support from other anti-war folks? Yes, mm -hmm. from the anti-war movement we yeah, did and yeah. the black movement, yes. Yeah. So we did the December um, uh, protest and then we did a March one, March 1970. And then the big one was August 29, 1970, where, you know, people estimate at least 30,000 people marching down Witter Boulevard mm -hmm. saying, Raza si guerra no. Mm -hmm. And in that big march uh, with a peaceful rally at, at uh, Laguna Park, now called Salazar Park, was attacked by the LEPD and the sheriffs. And now we know now that the, um, the uh, La Opinion uh, uh, reporter, Isaís Alvarado, three years ago filed the Freedom of Information on Sal Castro. Mm -hmm. And he found out that the FBI was working with local police doing intelligence gathering even before the walkouts and before the moratorium. And it shows that their concern was that the, um, the Chicanos would get together with the blacks and start challenging uh, the, anti the movement, the war in Vietnam. So this was, um, hmm. now who, who, who was president at that time? Like, okay, you're talking 69 now. Okay, because Nixon, no, not Nixon. Johnson decided not to run, right? 68. So Nixon got elected. So here we are in 69 and 70. It's already Nixon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it was Nixon, Hoover, FBI. Uh, there, there's tons of files that this reporter got. I don't know if you're interested in them. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that showed that the FBI was working with local police in intelligence gathering. And they knew, you know, uh, not that they knew they were ready. They had full force of LEPD and sheriffs on hmm. August 29th. And they provoked, you know, they provoked an incident and they attacked the peaceful rally. It was a peaceful rally. They had folklorico dancing, they, they attacked it brutally with tear gas and batons. And it created a whole rebellion that day. And that day, Ruben Salazar, who uh, was the uh, news director for the KMEX uh, 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 news station, KMEX, TV station was on the ground with a cameraman covering that whole event. And he had also written a series of articles for LA Times, critical police abuse, immigration abuse, Chicano identity. He interviewed me. He interviewed me and David and Ralph, and he wrote about us. Uh, and, uh, and, he, and I remember they talking to, to him, and he would say, you know, he would listen to us, sympathetic, but he, I remember one time he told me, but Carlo, you know, the system works. Hmm. The system works. He kind of kind of let the system work. Oh, he said, yeah, you know, he said, no, we want a revolution. The system don't work. We want a new system. You know? <laughs> By that time, we were already saying, forget it, you know. Uh, we need a, a revolution, and we want Chicano power. But he, um, he was killed by the sheriffs that day, as well as Lynn Ward and Angel Diaz. But there was a whole rebellion. So, so back up, we didn't find out until the La Opinion got those uh, uh, files that uh, the sheriff LEPD, now this, this is uh, sheriff territory, but they had the LEPD there in, you know, in full force, you know, in my view, ready to disrupt and attack us. 
you know, and, and, and destroy that, that anti-war movement. And, and they did, because they killed Rubin, they disrupted the movement. So by, after that, the movement became defensive. You know, they arrested Corky Gonzalez, they tear gassed the whole neighborhood. Have you ever seen some of those news clippings on that? No, or, 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 you know, August 29, Requiem 29. Now, but, you know, by, by the end of 1969, I had already been arrested almost a dozen times. Not only the grand jury indictments, but just arrest, you know, harassment arrest uh, for being, a, you know, a Brown Beret, a Brown Beret lead. I was a minister of information. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> You know, for some reason, uh, you know, I, I was, when I was at the Garfield High School walkouts, uh, the reporters were running around trying to interview people, and nobody would interview them. Then they saw me with the beret, and we want to interview one of you. Are you one of the leaders? And I go, no, I'm not a leader. And I said, well, we want to talk to a leader. And I said, well, I'll talk to you, but, you know. So they interviewed me, right? So when I got back to the Brown Beret office, La Perania Coffee, Al David confronted me. He said, well, what do you do in the interview? Hey, well, they wanted to do something. You know, we can't just let them not do an interview. Anyways, I was made the Minister of Information <laughs> after that, you know. I was minister. So then I was supposed to speak at the rallies, right. anti-war rallies, press conferences. So I started uh, being very visible and uh, getting arrested and harassed. Uh, uh, another major uh, struggle in 68, 69 was at East L.A. College. I, I was still in La Vida Nueva. I had one foot there and then the other foot the Brown Berets. We led a, a student strike for ethnic studies, black studies yeah, right, and right. Chicano studies. Yeah. And uh, it was La Vida Nueva, Black Student Union. And it, you know, it, it took days and weeks, but the final day when we shut down the college, the administration called the sheriffs. And the sheriffs came on campus with a whole line of, of police and beat and arrested people and disrupted the, 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 the strike. And then yeah, I went home, you know, got in my car with my family, friends, and, and they followed me and arrested me. And they, they accused me of assault and battery on a cop, you know, and I went to trial on that. Uh, I was also at a, at a rally at a college, uh, I think it was uh, Mount San Antonio College, where I got arrested there. They said I had a gun. I was found not guilty. Uh, the, during the times that I was in, in jail, the um, I got beat up twice. Well, actually, once in the jail and once in the street. Mm -hmm. LEPD stopped me one time and provoked me. You know, they handcuffed me, started pushing me around, and I made the mistake of saying, hey, we'll take the cu cuffs off. So they all right, take them off, come on. And then they started hitting me, and I go, oh, shit, <laughs> they're going to kick the shit out of me, right? Well, they did, you know. Mm -hmm. But I didn't fight back because the other guy was sitting there with a billy club ready like this, you know. I had been arrested in the, uh, I think it was, I lost track of which arrest, in the county, county um, uh, jail. Uh, they took me into a day room and started beating me up. And that time I fought back, so I'm already getting beat up, you know, so I might as well fight back. But uh, inside the jail, they, they, had, they had gloves and they didn't have the, the billy clubs because they didn't have it. Right. Yeah, so, so um, the um, other thing I wanted to point out, so I'm getting all these arrests, right? The, the, the East LA 13, the assault and battery and the cop, the Biltmore 6 case. So I'm getting bailed out and going to court on all these cases, right. right? The first time we go to court for the Biltmore 6, uh, uh, well, actually for the arraignment, where they're going to give testimony to see if there's enough evidence to hold us for trial. Right. Not the first one, because the first one, four people got, got cut loose. They had Fernando Sumaya there as a witness, the undercover cop. Right. Okay. So we're in the Hall of Injustice, we call it, you know, the old the building where the Manson trial took place, where the Sleepy Lagoon case took place, historic place, right, an old building. So I go in there, you know, the, I think Gloria was there. I don't know if you talked about that. Gloria was there, and the Brown Bray women were there, Lorraine Escalante was there. Other Brown Berets were there. Fernando Sumaya is going to testify. Dang, we got to be there. So I had a little job, you know, and I had a briefcase with my students. So I walk in with my briefcase and I sit down. And Sergeant Abel Armas, who was part of the intelligence group, sits next to me and looks at me. And then he opens up his coat 
they had a big giant revolver and he, and he puts his hand and he looks at me like that. And I go, fuck it, I'm looking at him. And I go, shit. And then Fernando Sumaya is up there and I go, what the hell is going on here, you know? So I'm sitting there and then I go, oh shit, I better call my job. You know, am I going to be there, right? I had a little job. So I go out to the lobby, to the phone booth, mm-hmm. and I dial and I'm talking. Hey, you know what? I'm, I got to be in court. I can't go to work today. I'll be late. And, you know, the old-fashioned uh, 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 telephone booth. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden I hear this noise and somebody pushing on the, on the door. And it says, uh, Abel Armas, big tall Chicano Husky guy with a couple of other suits and sheriffs with them. And they start pushing and I'm caught and I go like this and I try to like, you know, what's, you know, and then, you know, I, it's like, anyway, they, they busted the door. They pushed my legs open, they busted the door open, they dragged me out, you know, and I'm here on the phone, you know, that guy had heard of what happened. They go, ah, because later on I had him go to court <laughs> to testify uh-huh. that I had called him. Anyway, they dragged me out and I checked this out. They grab my briefcase, and one of the other cops pulls a gun. Oh. And he's gonna about to go like this, but then the brown bray woman, Andrea and Lorraine, he's got a gun, he's got a gun, he's got a gun, he put it back. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they arrested me anyway for resisting arrest. But they were trying to plant a gun in me, you know, or, or the, you know. So they arrested me, and then they took me in the back of, of the, uh, of the lobby and, and, oh, and Lorena Scalante got arrested too for trying to protect me or help me mm-hmm. out. So we're sitting there, you know, like this, and Armas and Asumaya come out and started making jokes. Ah, you guys, yeah, you know, making fun of us. I said, look, we're arrested here, just, you know, get, take us wherever you gotta take us so we can get bailed out, you know. So I don't know whether they thought I was gonna try to do something to Sumaya or they were trying to entrap me or mm-hmm. provoke me. Because that, 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 that was their style, entrapment. Right. Uh, because I mentioned earlier that uh, Sumaya had gotten two of those airborne guys arrested at a firebombing of a, yeah. of a Safeway station. And he was always advocating, let's go shoot up the windows. Or people who were criticized within the Chicano movement, oh, let's go shoot them up, right? So anyway, um, I got arrested for, dis- for resisting arrest, right? And later on, I had to go to court. And I had that, that my, the guy from, that I called, you know, yeah, he called me up, you know, and I heard all this loud noise, but I still got convicted, resisting arrest. So, um, so the, um, the uh, it, it was Sergeant uh, Lee Ceballos that told me, Carlos, you're gonna be dead, you're gonna, you're gonna be killed, or you're gonna spend the rest of your life in jail. You know, so, so this is what I was going through in 69, mm-hmm. right? Arrest, bail out, going to get beat up. And uh, I couldn't even, you know, organize anymore. So, um, you know, I talked to Oscar Acosta. He goes, look, they're after you, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. So to make a long story short, I said, I'm out of here. I'm leaving the country. I'm going to, I'm going to. Uh, go on the land, as they say in the movies, or go on the ground, go on the ground. So I did, I did. I, in, in January 1970, I left the country with, with uh, my girlfriend and wife, uh, Olivia, and we went to live in Mexico. We were trying to get to Cuba. We never got there. We got to Yucatan and um, stayed there working for a year, ended up coming back to Juarez and lived in Juarez. And I got a job in El Paso working in a warehouse. And then I got a job as a carpenter apprentice. I was active in the carpenter union. And then in 72, there was a major garment strike. 5,000 Chicanos went out on strike for union recognition at FADA manufacturing plant. It was a major strike. And we got involved in that. We set up a worker center. So we started doing labor organizing, but you know, undercover. And immigrant rights organizing, solidarity with Mexico and El Paso. And then uh, also in 72, they had uh, the convention of la, El Partido de la Raza Unida Party, had a big convention there. We were there, but we were way up in the bleachers of the, of the uh, El Paso Coliseum because we didn't want to go down there. All the folks we knew were there. So we lived underground for seven years. You know, we were involved in... in uh, How many uh, years? Uh, pardon me? How many years? Seven years, from 70 seven years. to 77. Wow. We lived in El Paso. Wow. 
We, got, we had a house, I had two children, all under anonymous names or mm -hmm. assumed names, or what do you call anonymous names? Or mm -hmm. fake, fake names, right? Yeah. yeah and, and when had you gotten married? We got married in, 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 in January 70. Because okay. the way we did it, we wanted to have like a, a party to say goodbye to everybody, but we couldn't do that because then we know we're going right. you know, right. to jump bail. So we had, let's get married. So we got married in the backyard, no, no, in the living room with Father Luz. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had a party in the back with my ex-wife's uh, cousin had a band. And we, um, we uh, had a party and everybody was there, you know, the beret, different people. Hi, how you doing? A couple of days later, bam, we left the country. Yeah. We left the country, lived for seven years, stayed active. Uh, we, we, during the FADA strike, um, it was a national strike, you know, for, especially in a right, so-called right-to-work state, I'd rather mm -hmm. call it anti-union uh, anti state. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what happened, the new left sent people to organize. All the different left groups from the new left sent uh, organizers to help. So I got to expose to all the different groups. Are you familiar with the, the term the new left? Yes. You know, yeah. Or there's, yep. there's a couple of books written on it. I mm -hmm. think the Revolution in the Air, maybe. Mm -hmm. Have you read that yep. book? Yep. Okay. Can we pause for a second? Okay, so underground through 1977. So so come back. <laughs> right. So I lived on the ground in El Paso, yeah. Texas. I eventually moved to El Paso, Texas. I was a garment worker, a steel worker, a carpenter organizing. Uh, my wife was organizing too. We had a worker center. Were you so, able to keep in touch? No, Probably no, no, not at all. No, we oh. couldn't be in touch with anybody because we were paranoid of all the undercover cops of getting arrested. Mm -hmm. So, did you have any idea what was happening with the Brown Berets? And, or we would see the news and keep up with the news. Uh, now, Texas, El Paso doesn't get a lot of new, good news. It's kind of like you know backward mm -hmm. uh, in terms of media. So we don't, we wouldn't get everything. But you know, we heard about Ruben Salazar getting killed and. Uh, Actually, that one, when that happened, we were in Mexico City, front page of all the Mexico City newspapers. You know, Ruben had been a correspondent in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, I don't, do I get into, uh, off, the, off the, the major question is that we stayed in El Paso, had a son and daughter, all, all named, uh, born under a, a assumed name. What's the That's proper it. term? Right. Assumed assume. And we were doing fine, you know, we had a good life. I had my truck, I'd go hunting coyotes on the weekend, you know. <laughs> had our activism, um, let's see, 77. Okay, so 77, if it had been seven years, we should be able to go back, you know, and visit and come back. So we came in May of 77, we visited uh, my sister and her husband in the Gardena area, everything was okay a day or two. Then we came to Monterey Park, visited my, my, my wife's cousin. It was like a family reunion. And we were gonna go out to dinner that night, but the sheriff, no, excuse me, not the sheriff, the police raided the house. It was the Monterey Park police, and they had their whole outfits, you know, bulletproof vests with their rifles dogs, and LAPD. It was another sergeant, Lee, Lee Castruita, who was part of that, the group. And they raided the house, and there was no way to get out. They come in there with guns, pull me up against the wall, you're under arrest. They go, oh, shit. They're like shock, going mm -hmm. back, you know. Mm -hmm. I felt like living in the womb in El Paso, Texas. You know, we were back in my hometown, Juarez, El Paso. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what started was a two-year battle Justice for Carlos Montes, we had a defense committee, community activist group. We fought it for two years. I was found not guilty of all charges. Then yes. were you out on bail during that time? Yes. No. In? Well, after a month, I got out on bail. Okay. But the cops, uh, the, the DA and the cops say, don't let him out. He's going to run again. He ran once. He's going to run again. He said, no, I won't run. You know, put him in my mother-in-law's house as collateral. So I got bailed out. Oh, okay. We had a committee. We went to trial in November of 79, I was found not guilty, jury trial. It was me and Fernando Sumaya. So I was the last one of the Biltmore case. Oh, so that was still on the Biltmore charges? Yeah, that, that was, that yeah. Was. oh yeah, yeah, okay. Because okay, yeah. all, sure yeah. Yeah, all the other charges were, were the, the um, East LA 13 walkout mm -hmm. was, uh, was thrown out of court as mm -hmm. being unconstitutional, that we had a right to protest the school district. 
The other charges, you know, uh, I had beat the gun charge. I had uh, the one of resisting arrest. It was a small misdemeanor. Oh, the only one they still had me on was uh, assault and battery on a cop at East LA College. That one they said I had gone to trial. I had been convicted of a felony. And I said, no, it was a misdemeanor. It was, they accused me of throwing him a can. Yeah. And uh, he wasn't even hurt. But on the Biltmore case, I was found not guilty. But then they, they wanted me to go back on the East LA College case. I went to that one and they, they gave me like probation. Gave me probation and a thousand dollar fine. I remember saying a thousand dollar fine. <laughs> and they, they, the attorney said, be quiet, man. You ought to be really glad you're not in jail. So, uh, so then I went back, you know, to, so then it was, it was, by then I was living in LA and being active in, in community organizing in L.A. So in the 80s, you know, uh, I got a job with United Way. I was an organizer in the community. I went back with CSO, Community Service Organization, and got involved in the Jesse Jackson campaign in 84. We got involved in the immigrant rights movement, uh, pushing for immigration reform. So the 80s was about, you know, rebuilding the family, being back in L.A., uh, reestablishing my roots. Uh, in the 90s, we got into the uh, anti-war movement, the war in Iraq. Uh, we did a 20-year anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium in 1990. We had a big march, 5,000 people. For 1990, that's a big march. And um, but asked me some questions. So you so, kept so. at it, and, and, and you, how did you support yourself during that? I got a job. I got a job. I worked. I worked. I worked full time. I worked for United Way as an outreach worker. I worked as a job developer for the Mexican American Opportunity Foundation. I tried to get a job with uh, progressive nonprofits, but I was still kind of too hot. Mm. You know, here's Carlos Montt seven years later coming back, you know, right. conspiracy commit arson, the whole case. And we put a politi free political prisoner campaign. You know, we supported Leonard Peltier, uh, Native Americans who were political prisoners. Yeah. So we, you know, we raised the whole issue of po free political prisoners. So a lot of people wouldn't hire me because I was still too, um, too hot, yeah, mm -hmm. too radical, yeah. too militant. And by, you know, seven years later, some folks had given up on the movement. What, oh, what, what, what I what did happened forget. with the Brown Berets? What, what, what I, what the repression, yeah. the counterintelligence program, the FBI working with local police to infiltrate and disrupt the Black Panthers, the Brown Berets, yeah. militant organizations worked to a certain extent. And many organizations were disrupted and destroyed. People were sent to prison, killed, or jailed, or went on the ground to Canada, to Mexico, like myself. Other folks uh, were co opted by jobs, the War and Poverty Program. Other people got into electoral politics. Other people got into electoral, excuse me, labor organizing. Mm -hmm. There was a segment of the movement, though, that got into the new left. And not only the white, the black, and Chicanos got into the new left. They started looking at socialism mm -hmm. and organizing the working people to continue the struggle. But, but uh, the counterintelligence program, the COINTELPRO, was the major uh, uh, disruptive force that the Bromberies were disrupted and disbanded in 1972. Mm -hmm. I was in El Paso, Texas. The, Bron the Black Panthers were destroyed, uh, as well as uh, other, um, other movements. And uh, ask me, ask me okay, a question. Okay, so back to so your, uh, your working life and finding it Oh, right, right. Difficult okay, so, to find employment. Right, ways, yeah. difficult to find employment. Even the, some of the unions were afraid of me. I was too radical. So um, an old Brown Bray friend of mine, Richard Diaz, who was my, my buddy, my, my homeboy, my best buddy. I went to high school with him. We cruised. He's the one that, you know, the police said I could take to the Philly Club. He said, hey, come to work for Xerox. He was a sales rep, and I go, no, no, I'm not going to work for a corporation. So I, I worked for MAOF, Mixed and Rigop, as a job developer, finding jobs for ex-offenders. And he kept at it. It took him a year. He finally convinced me, look, you can make good money. You're always out in the field, outside. You don't, you don't like to be locked up in an office, and you're talking to people. And I can get you in because he became a manager. So he got me in. I was still uh, finishing probation from the old case, right? right. So he got me in. 
So it was kind of funny. I was kind of the oddball because all these young uh, business uh, people from USC, UCLA, and I was this old Chicano guy coming in here, you know. I had a beard. I didn't know how to dress as a suit, you know. I, I, one time I walked in wearing a short sleeve shirt. They made fun of me. <laughs> you don't wear a short sleeve shirt. You got to wear a long sleeve shirt. No polyester suits, of course. <laughs> you know, I had to learn that right away. So I, I became, you know, I learned that. That it was a lot of fun because you're out there talking to people and you know, we're selling copiers. So, you know, I learned how to do it, started making a little money, had my kids in school, bought a house, you know, so I built my family. Mm -hmm. my, my wife got a job. Um, Meanwhile, you had plenty of issues to keep working on. Yeah, yeah, we, we started, we continued the issues. We tried electoral politics with the Jackson campaign, 84, 88. We did the community service organization. In the 80s was immigration reform. The, uh, during the Reagan era, he became president, the uh, Immigration Reform Naturalization Act. And then, um, you know, the Solidarity Movement, Central America, we did a little bit of that uh, with the uh, Committee of Solidarity with, with uh, El Salvador. Not heavily involved in it, but supportive of it. And then um, there was the other thing I mentioned. We did the 20-year anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium. It was a way to re, re, rejuvenate the Chicano movement. We had 5,000 people marching. We brought up similar issues. You know, the war in Iraq, the, the first invasion of Iraq was coming up. We opposed that. And the 90, the 90, I forget what happened in the 90s. Remind me of so, or ask me a question. Let's see. Raising our children, going to high school. Yeah, I was active in CSO, Community Service Organization. So mm -hmm. we did, we took, oh yeah, the 90, 93, 94, we formed uh, the Rainbow Coalition for Justice. There was several young Chicanos killed by the sheriff. One was shot in the back, young teenager, and they shot him through the back, and then this, they, the, the bullets came through his mouth, they busted out his teeth, and there was also some blacks killed. So we had the Rainbow Coalition for Justice on the issue of police brutality, 93, 94. There was a scandal with the, with the county, LA County sheriffs. They had the, the Vikings uh, uh, gang within the sheriffs. They were doing hits on people. So there was a big scandal on it. You know, there was a big investigation. So we're part of the issue of police brutality, trying to get uh, reform through the system of Sacramento. And this is an issue that had been in existence forever. It's in right? existence in the 60s. Yeah. It's in existence today. Today we're still fighting uh, Edwin Rodrigo was killed by the sheriff, shot 17 times on uh, February the 14th. We're fighting with that case today. So in the 90s we took up, you know, the issue of police brutality. Oh, yeah, Angel, uh, the, uh, Angel, um, no, no, excuse me, not that was Angel Ortiz, sheriff, and then uh, Smokey Jimenez killed by the L.E. By the and, and the Ramona Gardens, by the sheriff that came out of the jurisdiction, he still came into city territory. So there was a rebellion there. So we combined those two cases and and did the Rainbow the Rainbow Coalition for Justice. The nineties, yeah. And in the nineties too, there was a sort of a youth movement, right? I mean, there was. I guess you've probably seen waves of, of younger people join at, at certain times. That's true. That was true. There were there was young Latino Chicano youth movement that came through, identifying more with the indigenous culture, right. and then you know graduating from college and raising the issue of uh, affirmative action was always there. College admissions, ethnic studies was always an ongoing struggle. Great. So '90s into the 2000s, and we even jump to where we are right now. I mean. Yeah, the 2000 was a major upsurge in the immigrant rights movement through, due to the effect of NAFTA uh, in 94. Uh, and of course, you know, the other part was, how can I forget, the solidarity with the movement in Mexico, the Zapatista movement, all in the late 90s. Uh, we went to Mexico, my daughter went to the Zapatista uh, territory, you know, by then my daughter and my son are in their 20s, they're, they're activists on their own. And uh, so um, that, you know, whole, uh, the, the demographics in, in L.A. and the Southwest changed dramatically. We have millions of newer immigrants that are displaced 
uh, from the poverty and violence in Mexico and Central America coming to live in the United States. So that creates a whole uh, of, um, wave of organizing for immigrant rights. You know, they suffer the issues of police brutality, immigration abuse. So then in the, in the 2000s, we get into the mega marches of, you know, we organized, I was, I'm, you know, proud to say I was part of organizing the mega marches in 2006. Uh, we were on the ground at 8 a.m. Uh, with a. By that time, I was working with a union, SCIU. I transitioned out of a out of the corporation and I got into did a career change. By that time, I said, "Okay, I'll work for a union, a progressive union, SCIU, the County Workers Union." I was an organizer. <clears throat> we were part of the coalition to uh, for immigration reform. We went to a convention in February uh, uh, at the Riverside Convention Center where United uh, Immigrant Rights Activists from throughout the United States, primarily Chicano, and we said we're going to have big marches in March uh, against the Sensenbrenner Bill, which was a uh, bill that would criminalize being undocumented in the United States. And it had passed in December of 2005. So then we called for massive marches in March of 2006. And Chicago has almost half a million people marching on March the 10th. So when we hear about that, we go, whoa, we, that means like yeah, Chicago can do, you know, 400, half a million people, we're going to have to up it. So we did it in March 25th, though. We need a little bit more time, right? <laughs> So March 25th, uh, 25th, that was a 25th, 26th, 27th, that was a Saturday, yeah. We, downtown on Olympic and Broadway, we got there 8 o'clock in the morning with a delegation of members from uh, SCIU, uh, health care workers, and it was already packed. Olympic and Broadway was, was bodies, bumper to bumper bodies. We, we wiggled our way down to, to Broadway and looked up Broadway. Broadway was already full. I'm t I see a people from Broadway all the way down to City Hall. We had to take Spring, uh, a street to the east of it, to be able to walk up. So then, uh, and what, what we had noticed is, uh, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people had been uh, using uh, the, the train, the bus, the walking. You know, when we were driving to the beginning site of families, you can see the whole family, the grandparents, the parents, the kids. Uh, marching, you know, getting to the start, starting site. Now that was on um, March 25th, 2006, the big mega marches. And then um, on the... On the to your emotional reaction, having worked in all of these causes for so long and to see something like that. Yeah, it was exhilarating. I mean, it was, it, it's always exhilarating and exciting to be in a march, but to see a sea of people you know, and you see the whole LA Civic Center was inundated with Chicano, New York, Mexican immigrants, Central Americans. The whole city was inundated. The freeways were full, the metros were full, the buses were at a standstill. It was like, you know, it was a, a major takeover of downtown Civic Center that the police weren't even ready for. You know, if we had taken out a rebellion, it would have been a rebellion, but it was a march. And the demand was stop the criminalization of immigrants, which we won. The bill was was withdrawn, or, or, or and um, the uh, on Monday, uh, March the twenty seventh, the students walked out. Forty thousand students, according to the media, walked out all over the state of California and marched on city halls. So you know, Monday morning we were at the union office. We got the call. Let's go down and help the students, right? And uh, I was I was able to get on the radio station with uh, the the number one Spanish language station, uh, Piolin, because um, what happened? How did it happen? Uh, they were talking about it, and then uh, oh yeah, in early March the movie, the HBO movie, had come out on the walkouts. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's why I'm bringing this whole up. The original walkout, you know, it took them years to come up with a movie. HBO movie finally produced a movie. It came out in early March, so it became very popular. Even though it was an HBO, it was within the Chicano community, everybody was watching the movie. Walkout, walkout, walkout. So I, I have a strong, you know, uh, position that that helped the walkouts of the students in, in the and 2006. You're portrayed in the, in the movie, right? And I'm portrayed in the movie, that's true. And uh, so, so what happened, I called... Uh, 
the, the radio station. They said, look, the students are walking out at, you know, the movie, and then, who are you? Well, I'm Carlos Monte. I'm in the walkout. You know, oh, you're that guy? Yeah, yeah. And he goes, can you put us in touch with uh, uh, El Pachuco or uh, James Edward Olmos? I go, yeah, well, I'll call the producer of the movie, Moctezuma Esparza, and he can get a hold of him. He wanted to put us on the air live. So I said, okay, so I'm going to call Moctezuma. He called James Edward Olmos, and then we called in the station. They interviewed us Monday morning, the 27th during the student walkouts of, of, uh, throughout the whole state. And, you know, I called for continued walkouts. They asked us, they asked each one of us, what do you think, you know? And Edward almost was, oh, they made their point, they should go back to school. I said, come on, man. <laughs> and then Moctezuma was a little bit like, well, you know, it's a good history, you know? And I was saying, walk out, walk out. <laughs> I I kept, since I was on the radio, I, I kept telling everybody in Spanish, huelga, huelga, salgan a las, a las huelgas, you know? So, and, and then, you know, so that was great. You know, no, to us, it was exhilarating having the students use that tactic that we used back in 68. But, in, but, but Saturday on the 25th, to see that massive rally, the whole city hall was surrounded. Have you seen some of those pictures? You see the whole sea of, of people up and down Broadway, First Street, and even Spring. We barely were able to walk up Spring. And then... Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, and then, you know, there was marches all up and down, uh, all over the country that started, and then we did a May Day. May Day, we two, two mega marches, one downtown and one down on Wilshire. Massive, mm -hmm. massive. So uh, to us, it's saying the movement is back, you know, and the, the newer immigrants that have come to the community are building the movement, you know, they're, 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 the newer immigrants, the adults that are coming, they have the identity uh, culture as being Mexican, Central American, but their children are being uh, uh, part of the Chicano experience, you know, being bilingual, seeing the racism, the crowded schools, the police brutality, what I went through. Sure. And um, that helped create a whole student movement, the, the La Vida Nueva, United Mexican American Students, we came Mecha, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aztlán, Mecha's all over the colleges, all over the U.S., immigrant rights organizations uh, all over the U.S. that still exist today, that are still fighting for immigration reform. Do you have and, to, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, in every May Day, we go out and march. We did a May Day march and rally in Ball Heights the community service organization, which I organized with, with the Ball Heights Neighborhood Council. We did a May Day March in Ball Heights. For, from 206 to 20, uh, uh, let's see, you know, 14, we, we kept doing the big mega marches downtown. Of course, it got smaller and smaller. We weren't able to keep up, you know, the mega marches, right? right. right. So now we do them in Ball Heights. Um. And, um, what, what, the other thing is that, is that you know, the, the 2000 period, there was a second invasion of Iraq, right? So we, we continued that. Uh, we formed a group called Latinos Contra la Guerra, where we got families and students involved in our, our, our opposition to the war in Iraq. And we marched down Wheeler Boulevard in 2003. I think it's important to point that out. We took the same route from Belvedere Park to Salazar Park and held a march and rally. Same route as the moratorium? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. but on the issue of the second invasion of Iraq and the yeah. Tinos Contra la Guerra, and then what we did, that we integrated the local issues. We want schools, not war. We want, you know, mm -hmm. education, not war. So that was the other part of the 2000, besides immigration, the war issues. And, um, you know, taking on uh, international issues, solidarity with Mexico, solidarity with struggles in Colombia, you know, the, the Plan Colombia. We, we, you know, we, we try to fight the whole epidemic of the, the, uh, the crack and cocaine invasion. But we saw the link of Plan Colombia that the Clinton administration was pumping a billion dollars into the Colombian uh, government military against uh, really its own people. But I'm kind of going off no, a little bit. Good. Ask me a good. question so it's I can good. bring it back. No, well, I was going to ask you, you know, you're obviously, I mean, your activism, you continue your activism throughout, but I was going to ask if, if the um, harassment against you also continued. Right. Well, well, you know what? Uh, due to my uh, solidarity, I'm glad you asked that question. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> due to my solidarity, I've been to Colombia twice, right? 
And I have friends that are active in the anti-war movement that are an organization called the Anti-War Committee, Fight Back News, uh, um, Columbia Action Network, uh, Palestine's uh, Solidarity Organization. Uh, and we, what we do, we do trips to Palestine, Colombia, and Mexico, and we come back and we uh, educate people what we've seen. And, and we denounce what we, we consider, what I consider human rights violations mm -hmm. that are uh, perpetrated or supported by funding from Plan Colombia, especially in, in Colombia. So I met with uh, the Coca-Cola workers in Colombia who are trying to organize a union and they're being uh, kidnapped and assassinated. Afro-Colombianos who are being displaced from their land, uh, human rights activists that are being killed, you know, in Colombia. So um, when I came back to the U.S., I did a speaking tour to denounce Plan Colombia, the U.S. government role supporting the the, the Uribe uh, repressive government of Alvaro Uribe and the military. Uh, apparatus of, of, of spying on its own people, or using the money to, to give uh, rewards to the military for what they call, uh, um, I forget the Spanish word, but false uh, killings. You know, they would, they would kidnap people, peasants, and then dress them in guerrilla outfits say they would be killed another one, you know, to bring up their numbers and get, get rewards. That was all documented, you know. But, um, some of my uh, uh, activist friends have been to Palestine. So uh, this network of activists through Fight Back News, Palestine Solidarity Group, Columbia Action Network, and um, the uh, Anti-War Committee, and also the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, we were uh, raided, now make sure I get the year right, 2010. 23 people, 22 people were raided in uh, 2010, from Chicago to, to Minneapolis to uh, one guy in San Jose by the FBI. Now, they were raided, but they weren't arrested. It was, it, it was called the, uh, the, um, the uh, they were raided by the FBI, and what they did is that they had warrants to search their phones or computers and all their files, mm. right? And the issue, the warrant was looking for, um, it's a long warrant, but the main, and the main part was uh, investigation for providing material support to the PFLP and the FARC. The PFLP is the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Palestinian group, and then the FARC is the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, right? And, um, Nobody was arrested, but they took all their files. In one case, Joe and Stephanie Eisbaker, they were there like all day long, taking out boxes, boxes, you know. Uh, Hatham Abudea, uh, a Palestinian American activist in Chicago, you know, raided his house. McKelly, uh, Jess Sundin. So um, what we did, we started to stop the FBI committee, and we fought back. Right, now that was in, uh, and say, um, you know, this is harassment. Our, our theme or slogan was solidarity is not a crime. We're anti-war activists. We're in solidarity with Palestine, Colombia. But, we're, but there's no proof, and, and you would have arrested us if there was any proof, you know, providing material support. And what does material support mean to them, you know? So no one was arrested, just investigation, ongoing investigation, ongoing investigation. We go to marches, demos, we formed the, 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 now in my case, 2011 in May, my house was raided by the sheriff's SWAT team and the FBI on the similar allegations of providing material support to the FARC and the PFLP. Now, the, the excuse they used to raid my house and arrest me is that I had a felony conviction from 1969 from the uh, student strike for Chicano studies at East LA College, right? So that was the uh, part of the probable cause because I had, uh, I had uh, purchased guns legally, you know, through the, at, at the local hardware, not hardware store, sporting goods store. So I did have guns, but they were registered guns. 
And, but they use that as an excuse saying, you're a, a felon from 69, you can't have these guns. So they arrested me and I had to go to trial. But what they did actually, they, 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 they broke down the house at five o'clock in the morning. You know, it was a, literally the sheriff's SWAT team. I was in bed asleep in the back bedroom. All I heard was a loud crash. I jumped out of bed and you're yelling, who is it, who is it? And I see these lights with these little rifles, not little rifles, rifles, the little lights on top and the helmets and the and bulletproof vest. And then I, you know, I jumped out of bed. I was like, who is it? I, the police, police, your car, little motor. like, oh shit, what the hell's going on? You know, I said, it was shocking. And they arrested me. Uh, I was in jail for a few days. My family bailed me out. Uh, we formed a committee, uh, Free Carlos Montes Committee, part of the Fight Back News, part of the Stop FBI Coalition. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a year, I was found not guilty. Uh, I, uh, well, hang on, wait, back that, back that. Uh, the, the, uh, when I went to court, the charges started getting dropped. I had six felonies against me. I forget what they all were, felon with a gun or, or buying guns, you know. So they started dropping some of the charges. I had three left. So uh, we went to court and we did a full campaign, uh, you know, call um, the DA's office, uh, petitions. Every time we would go to court, we would, we would um, pack the courtroom, drop the mm -hmm. charges. We did petitions to Obama, to Eric Holder, because we know it was, it was linked to the uh, investigation into our anti-war activities. So what we finally did is did a campaign on the local DA by um, calling. They taking your files too, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They took my files, right. photographs, computers, uh, cell phones, uh, you know, all the memory cards and everything. And um, we had a defense committee, uh, offense committee. So we packed the courtroom. We jammed the district attorney's office by calling his phone, drop the charges, drop the charges. Finally, they, they said, okay, well, you know, they got tired of it. They go, what do you want? What do you want? Drop the charges. Hell no, we're not going to drop the charges. They wanted me to, to, um, to uh, do time in jail, like plead guilty to something, and we'll drop the charges and do a year or two. Just said, no, I'm not going to do it in jail. So we went back and forth, went back and forth. Finally, they said, look, we'll drop everything, uh, plead to something. And uh, they still wanted me to do jail. And I said, no, no, I'm not. And I said, I told my attorney, let's go to trial. Let's go to trial. But they said, look, you go to trial, you could win, you could lose, you never know, no guarantee. So in the end, they said, okay, look, uh, plead to something, we'll give you probation. And uh, like they wanted five years probation. I go, nah, that's too long. You know, something's going to happen. So, okay, three years probation. So, um, I pleaded guilty to one count. I forget what the heck it was. It was, uh, uh, we, we kept debating whether it was a felony or, or a misdemeanor. You know, they had evidence that it was a felony. We had evidence that it was a misdemeanor. So I, I pleaded guilty to, 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 to buying a gun, I think, as, uh, that I should have told them, that I should have said I, was a, I had been a felon in 1969, you know, knowing, you know. So I went to, so went to court and then they gave me three years probation. They dropped all the charges and I was able to go back to organizing. About a year and a half, two years later, I went back to court and filed a motion to have that drop. And the DA objected to it, jumped all over. No, no, you said three years. I said, no, I never, I said, that's what you said, three years, <laughs> you know. And then, so the judge agreed, there's an interest of justice, I don't think why this should go forward. So he dropped the probation and, and expunged the record for that, for that charge. Yeah, so I continue organizing today with community service organization. We primarily work on immigrant rights. Uh, our last campaign was to fight for deferred action for DAPA, deferred action for parents of Americans, and DACA, deferred action for children arrivals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we had a campaign to write and call the Supreme Court, but unfortunately we lost. It's the temporary setback. The Supreme Court was deadlocked four to four. Uh, they couldn't rule on whether Obama had the, the authority to do an executive order on deferred action. So, you know, we'll continue organizing the community. Uh, what we did over the years, we fought against the uh, car impounds for Folks that are, uh, don't have a driver's license, we fought for a driver's license. We were able to get a California driver's license bill 
for undocumented, that passed. We're also able to, uh, to stop the, uh, the car, uh, check, uh, car checkpoint or checkpoint where they stop people to see if they have a license and they impound their car. So we, we're, we worked on, on bread and butter issues that affect the community, but on the ongoing struggle to fight for legalization for all. And that's part of our struggle in the Chicano movement for self-determination and for equality. It, you know, it's not just an immigrant rights struggle. I see it as part of our ongoing struggle for, for equality and part of our ongoing struggle for, against, re, against uh, repression that we lived through all these years. Our history of the Chicano power movement of today, we have many examples of fighting against uh, repression, whether it's political repression or police repression against our community. We're also working with the, um, Edwin Rodriguez's family this year who was killed by the sheriff. He was shot 17 times on February the 14th, 10 through the back, under the false pretense that, that, that it was a stolen car, it was not a stolen car. Then they said, we stopped him because his light on the license plate wasn't on, you know. Just a pretext to harass him. And then also we're, wait, we're waiting for, wait, excuse me, working with the family of Jose Mendez, a 16-year-old that was killed by the LAPD on February the 6th, which was a week right before Edwin Rodriguez. So these are immigrant families that have come to live in the United States, and then their children grow up in, the United, in East L.A., and their young men face the same police harassment that I faced growing up, except they're getting killed and harassed. So we fight for the issue of uh, a police, um, to stop the police killings as part of the struggle for equality and immigrant rights. Mm -hmm. So the struggle continues. The struggle yeah. continues. It's a long, hard struggle. We have a lot of, a lot of examples of resistance. In, 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 in our, if you look at the history of Chicanos from, from the 1848, the Mexican-American War, till today, every decade there's examples of resistance. And I'm glad that I'm part of the, of the, not only the 60s, but even today, fighting for, for uh, justice and equality for Chicanos and Chicanas. So when you hear about, when, when people use the, the, and this can be my last question, sure. but when, you, when people use the phrase civil rights movement, where do you fit in in that? What do you think, <clears throat> how do you think about it? Well, we're, we're part of that movement, you know, but, and, and, but as I said earlier, you know, we're part of the whole civil rights movement, but um, I think it's just a notch uh, higher or a step forward that it's part of the struggle for equality, to be free. We want to be free. You know, the, the, the blacks in the, in the civil rights movement, they want their civil rights, be able to vote, get a job, housing, education, but really the struggle is to be free, free as a people, and we're not free. We, you know, we're, we're not free as a people, we're not free as working people, so the struggle continues. Well said. <laughs> is that enough, is that enough, or do you have another question? So, uh, so next week, or two weeks from now, somebody comes to you, this is a hypothetical. Somebody says, Carlos, 1968, 50 years later, 2018 is the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign. We want you to organize here and try and recreate those circumstances. Could you do it, or is there a strategy that you would employ to do that, and are the issues the same now as they were then? The, the issues are similar, you know, but conditions have changed, you know. But, but you know, we're, we're, uh, working people are still suffering a, a recession. There's high unemployment or underemployment, low wages, especially among young people. Uh, you know, many people that have jobs or that are retired or have stable jobs don't see it. But, um, you know, homelessness, you know, in major cities uh, and uh, unemployment, underemployment, even students that have gone to college have a high student debt, right? So the conditions are, are you know, are different demographics. We have a higher uh, population of newer immigrants that have come in the last 20 years, especially from Mexico and Central America, from all over the world, actually. So if someone were to ask me to organize a poor people's campaign, I said, you, we've had newer examples. We had the Occupy movement. We had the immigrant rights mega movements. We had the Bernie of Sanders movement. You know, there, there's different tactics and different strategies uh, that can be used. Uh, in the poor people's movement right here in L.A., we have a, a, a vibrant, strong uh, homeless uh, movement, advocates, that different organizations. And we also have the Black Lives Matter movement. 
you know. So uh, we're back in the 90s, we had the um, Rainbow Coalition for Justice of Blacks and, and Chicanos uniting together. So I would say that um, there's organization doing that work now. And we would do a 50 year anniversary of the walkouts or, or the Bob Berets is coming next year, right? So 60, 68, you're right, uh, 2000 is coming around the 50, all these 50 year anniversaries, you know. But what I ask people, don't just commemorate the anniversary, uh, link it to the struggles of today. Make sure that they were commemorating the struggle of 50 years ago and the struggle that's going on today and that we got to be involved in that struggle and work with the young people, the new young generation, to train them and support them as, as leaders, as organizers. Was so that good enough? Is that good enough that or was, what? That's great. I, I, that was really sweet. I kind of see this one, one little technical question. Did you ever get your files back? And work yes. <laughs> Yes, eventually, uh, you know, once I beat the case and everything was done, I, I got my files back. We know they copied everything, uh, right. of course. I got, I got my archives back because, yeah, they went through the whole, the, you know, this whole place was thrown, you know, photo albums, this whole closet over here in the back, the bed was thrown over. Yeah, yeah, I got my files back and um, the, um, yeah, I got them back. <laughs> And I donated some of them to the Cal State LA Library and Archives. And uh, one big thing I forgot to mention. Damn, how can I forget that? Well, so so part, part of the FBI harassment, is, I mentioned because of our solidarity work, but the other big part is that we, we really got on their radar when we organized the march on the Republican National Convention 2008 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we have a, a strong base of activists, the anti-war committee, the Fight Back News, and we marched on the RNC, and I was there, and we were there for several days, uh, marching, protesting, sitting down the street, and we did it again, uh, so that's when we got on their radar. And, and, and uh, they sent an FBI infiltrator to the anti-war committee by the name of Karen Sullivan who works for the FBI. I don't know where she's at now. But she infiltrated the anti-war committee, infiltrated Fight Back News, infiltrated Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And then during the raids, you know, when we were trying to find out where everybody was, we kept calling her and they called back, say, hey, don't bother calling her, she's one of us, mm -hmm. meaning one of the FBI. And then again, in 2012, eight, nine, we marched at Tampa, uh, Florida, at the RNC against Romney, and our slogan was, Money for human needs, not for war. You know, stop the warmongers. Uh, uh, McCain in 2008, and then Romney in, in 2012. And, you know, I'm not going to be there, but we're doing another march in, in, in uh, Cincinnati in July, July 18, 19. We're calling March on the RNC. The same slogan, money for human needs, not for war. Dump, this can we're adding dump Trump. And, and the CSO locally, we had a lot of protests against Trump. We went to the uh, Simi Valley uh, Reagan Presidential Library when they had the candidates uh, debate. We were outside protesting, dump Trump, you know, stop the racist uh, Republican agenda. That's a good way to end. <laughs> stop. All right, all right, all right. Oh, there's so much all to right. go on, right? right. Yeah, so much hours. to go but on. Let's stop there. Let me just say thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, no, is thank you. And we really appreciate all the work that you've done. And, oh, and thank you. Today. No, absolutely. You know, the, I'm glad that you're, uh, you're doing this project to document uh, the movement and to carry on the struggle so that other generations can learn from it and, and continue the struggle. That? Yeah. All right. All thank right. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.